Hello, this is the Tangle Express. We're in Imphal, Manipur. And for this special segment, we have a very dynamic personality with us. He is a former MLA from Manipur, this time vying for the MP seat from Outer Manipur constituency. The candidate from Indian National Congress, Mr. Alfred Kangam Arthur. I appreciate you taking time out for this because I know you've been very busy lately with your campaigns and election preparation. And you're trying to, or you're aspiring to represent the people through the INC. And as far as manifesto goes for the Congress, this time I think you're banking on social justice and also equity. And when we talk about equity, I think it hits home because I know you've been very outspoken regarding your concern um, for lack of, say, uniform development in Manipur. So could you talk about Congress manifesto and how it aligns with your aspiration for the people, for Manipur? Good morning, Yazuri. Long time. Last met you in Krul, I think, some few years back. Right. It's great. It's great, you know, that uh, our people should also have a way of understanding the nuances of what politics is all about. Everybody has their own perspective to life and to the desires that they wish to carry for our people. I, being such a person in this institution, uh, there is no ready-made answer for such things. This uh, journey to contest for the parliamentary elections, this is not something that just came about on its own or that, uh, that I had lost the last MLA election, so now it would be better to shift my focus towards the parliament. No, it's nothing to do of that sort. Mm -hmm. One thing that is clear is this is just a continuation of the path that I've been following. There can be no distractions, no deviations. This is something that is clear. Your concept to reality and your perspective to what exactly it is that you want to achieve as a target for your people, that destination, that cannot change. The goalpost can never change. Goalpost is still the same. The only thing is that the institution becomes bigger. See, the relationship between the union and the state how the federal setup is made in this nation, one has to understand the reality that we live in. I am grateful that uh, I've had beautiful and wonderful parents, good siblings that have taught me many values in life, many, many things which uh, I would not have been able to learn in textbooks or by any other medium. So today, through my friends and through my near and dear ones, the little bit of achievement that and the experience that I've had. I'm just trying to make sure that where I can apply this to bring about a strength, right down, that will, you know, this will percolate down to the grassroots that will make them feel wanted, that will make them feel, you know, inclusive in every way. So where do you start? How do you start this? See, the problem with this nation is there are unlimited powers that are absolved to the state. Once a relationship is built, as in like, once you give a statehood to a state, there are many subject matters which are absolute to the state. For example, with regard to land, with regard to finances, with regard to law and order. So likewise, the, these departments, these subject matters that are delegated or relegated to the state, they have absolute powers. It is the duty of the state to ensure that equity is a parameter under which equality should be decimated, disseminated to the common man. Today, the problem that is arising in Manipur is this imbalance mm -hmm. of infrastructure, be it human resource, every core sector that you look at, you will see this imbalance. Way back in 2009, the Ministry of Donor under the Home Ministry, they had published an infrastructure development index for the Northeast, mm -hmm. whereby Imphal West was number one. Mm -hmm. And the hill districts, when you count them, they, they were, you count them from backwards. There were about 78 districts that time, I think. So, Taking all these factors into consideration, 
We live in one state, it's a small state, inhabited by different, different communities. But yes, the factor here is the beauty of democracy, like uh, my, my father always told us, and like people who are the owners and people who know the owners of what it is to be the harbingers of democracy. They are very clear on this concept that what is democracy all about? It says, listen to the voice of the weakest and bring this at par with the strongest. You cannot have any sort of partiality in this. The moment you succeed in doing that, then you know that the people's voices have been heard. Today, the problem here is, it is the duty of the majority. The major, the, see, the question of democracy itself, this word, majority of democracy, this word itself is flawed because a majority can always mean the sheer numbers would do whatever they want. So, like people always say in India, it's majoritarian. For example, in context to Ukrul, you're also a Tankul, I'm also Tankul. If you talk of the cookies in, Tank, in the Ukrul area, they're just 3%. Supposing I wanted it my way, mm -hmm. and I say I would do things my way, they would not even get their you know, daily food to eat. There are many things that I, I would be able to suppress totally. Right. And within, I, I do not need to you know, physically beat them or kill them. But the thing I would do is finish them off politically, their social lives, their economic standards would come to base level zero. So when that happens, what happens? Then their generations are done for. They have no future. Today, this disparity in allotment of wealth or the sharing of budget, this has to be done in such a way as is mandated in the constitution or is mandated by law. All we are saying in a progressive and inclusive democracy or in this state is that everything has to happen as per discussions. You have to communicate. You have to discuss. There are many a time when nobody wants to discuss anything. You have it my way or don't have it. So when that is the case, one day will finally come when I'll say, All right, I want it my way. Why should you have it your way all the time? So when that happens, then everything starts, you know, um, breaking apart at different levels. So this being a reason, wanting to come and contest in the Lok Sabha elections, this follow-up action of what I was in the last five years, from 2017 to 2022, mm -hmm. as a member of the Legislative Assembly of Manipur, I know exactly what I have tried to impress on the state government, the duty of a legislator, be it ruling or the uh, opposition. Mm -hmm. What is defined as the Representation of People's Act is very clear. It doesn't define that ruling MLAs should speak nothing. Mm -hmm. And opposition MLAs are the ones to speak no. What does the law say? The law is very clear. Any and all MLAs, the legislator is there, is there to hold accountable the executive. Now, just because you are part of the ruling dispensation, if you don't hold the executive you know, accountable, mm -hmm. then what is the future ahead? So many a time our people get confused thinking that the ruling class cannot question their own governments. Then the people who have elected you to office, they never said, if you are in ruling, don't ask. And when you contested elections, you never told the people, if I am in the ruling, I'll not hold my government accountable. In government, you are because you are there. And if they are not adhering to your request, it means that you have no choice but to bring them to the house and you know grill your own government to make sure that the aspirations and dreams and desires of the electorate mm. who have sent you there, that is at least respected. So today, this reason as to why I've come and then wanting to go to parliament to represent you know, various communities right. that are inhabiting the hill areas. Mm. This disparity, if you go to, for example, Sugnu mm. in the valley itself, mm. if you go to Hirok in the valley itself, so these are the interiors of the valley. If you go and see the, the, their, their living standards, you'll also notice that they are also deprived. So how does this change? How do, how, how do you make sure that all of this changes? All these institutions that were formulated by the Union of India, this Panchayati Raj system, or this Autonomous District Council system, this is to decentralize power from the top, to make sure that the person nearest to you, whom you can approach easily, you have access to that person, and then you get your job done at that level. 
Today, there are no powers whatsoever. It is just namesake. This is why Parliament has to be reminded mm -hmm. that all these institutions that Parliament has legislated laws through which these institutions are functioning, they are more or less redundant today. Mm. And they cannot be redundant so that we can go on to the next step. This is why I, I am here to bring about equity, to bring about change. And for that, one man at the top can do nothing. Mm. You decentralize power right to the grassroots, be it to the you know, Zilla Parishads, be it to the Pradhans, be it to the members, be it to the autonomous district councils, be it to the villages. This is a necessity for a state like Manipur because it's those people there at the grassroots who would understand and who's, who would use their resources diligently within the system. Okay. So I think it is clear that your aspiration remains the same, be it the MLA uh, for a bid for the MP seat. And um, regarding this, I'd like to draw the attention of the, uh, what, uh, the audience regarding a re revolutionary bill that you brought about for the tribal people of Manipur. And I say you, I, I don't mean to say exclusively you, there could have been other parties involved in bringing about the bill, but I think you poured your heart and soul into it and you, you should be credited for the kind of attention you brought to that bill, uh, the kind of attention that people need to render to that particular bill. I'm talking about the ADC, HAC recommended uh, regarding Article 371C. But for you know the benefit of those listeners who are not very, say, um, well-versed with the provision given by this bill, could you talk about maybe in brief as to why we should be concerned about this particular bill? And I'm just assuming still that this is your priority. Yozuri, see, you have a lifetime to live. One, one gets one life. You have your set responsibilities. I was given mine. I was a legislator for five years. You see the wants and the needs of our people. I always differentiate what a want is and a need is. Today, what is the requirement of the different categories of people living in the state? A lot of our people are deprived of needs, not wants. Mm -hmm. Wants are desires. You can want anything in the world, mm -hmm. but needs is what a basic principle of life should be, a foundation whereby the primary concern should be to provide and ensure needs. Mm -hmm. That ADC bill of 2021, you know, people made it controversial for no rhyme, no reason. Why do I say this today? Like I said earlier, certain set principles within the framework of the federal setup of India. State has absolute powers to many subject matters. Within those powers, they established, when, when Manipur statehood was given in 1972, what went hand in hand with this was the insertion of Article 371C into the constitution. This is nothing new. I would like to tell you this very clearly and to your audience that this Article 371C is nothing new that India gave us. India just gave us a provision that would protect the people. Socially, economically, we were so much more deprived. Our people, the living standards were so much lower than the rest of mainland India, as well as in comparison to the valley. So India felt that our long lost tradition and heritage that is imbibed within our custom and our culture, this needed protection, which the outside world would have easily, easily, you know, polluted in no, in no span of time. So what India did is very clear. That time also, it was in the 70s, in 1971, 70, Indira Gandhi was the Home Minister. Everybody refers to Vivi Giri as the President. See, in, in India, after it became a republic and after India became independent, the thing here is that the President is just a monumental head. It's always the elected who are the bosses. So it was in 1970, 71 that Indiraji, she discussed on what the needs and the requirements of the hill people of Manipur would be to make sure that this age old connect that the valley and hills have had over the decades and over the centuries, this is also protected. At the same time, our people living in the hills, their rights are not trampled at, on, at all by anybody at any point in time. This Article 371C was inserted into the Constitution. This is nothing new. Mm -hmm. This is why I say. Mm -hmm. Now, the question here is, with the granting of statehood, there are certain subject matters which give absolute power to the state. This is why 
the government of India and the people of that time, the hill people, since they felt you know, insecure, thinking that we would lose our heritage, we would lose all of our ancestry that our people have left us, see, the, our customs, our traditions would be lost with time. Mm. This law was formulated and this particular article was inserted into the constitution. With the acceptance of this con constitutional provision, it was published in the Rules of Business in, in, the, in, in the Assembly of Manipur, mm. Manipur State Assembly. It has been in operation since 1972. Now, you cannot say that we have published in the rule book mm. and we are following this rule, mm. but you cannot use it. What I only did was I said, let us use it. Since you, oh, it, it has been published and the world feels, India also feels that this rule is being followed in the state of Manipur. All we said was looking at the disparities in many sectors in the hill and valley. If you want to recollect, if our you know, audience, be it young or old, the testament are all the videos and the audios that, that people can have access to in this day and age of the IT age. Mm -hmm. Everything is there in the air. You, all you have to do is access it. Mm -hmm. How many times I requested the state government? How many times? Mm -hmm. You know, decentralized decentralize for education. Do what is necessary. If you do not do this, this you know, this deprivation between the hill and the valley, where you have one you know, doctor in one primary health center mm -hmm. and you have 10 doctors in primary health centers in the valley, this, you, even the valley citizens would want to make sure that it is equal because we say we are one. Mm -hmm. And when these resources are deprived of and this lopsided you know, uh, allotment of human resource or infrastructure, this would be the final damaging effect that would bring about total decimation in the hills. I would keep harping on this and trying to remind the elected government. So if you go to the videos, the last budget session in 2021, the chief minister himself, this was before I introduced the bill in the, in the monsoon session. It was just a three-day session in monsoon session. But during the budget session, when we discussed, it's there in all you know, social media forum that the chief minister himself in the floor of the house, he got up and he said, I have formulated a rationalization committee for which the chief secretary is the chairman. My main focus is healthcare and education. These are his words, not mine, in the floor of the house. When you speak in the floor of the house in a system like India, be it the state or in the parliament, it means you're assuring the people. You cannot cheat the people. Mm -hmm. So he stood up and he personally said, because knowing how passionate about, I was about bringing about these revolutionary changes, at least in healthcare and education. And mind you, education is a fundamental right under Article 21, mm -hmm. as legislated by Parliament. And healthcare has also been declared a fundamental right by the Supreme Court. So these two are both fundamental rights. You cannot deprive citizens of fundamental rights. Mm -hmm. When the entire hills the disparity and the fundamental right to healthcare and education. You are playing with this. You cannot do this. What does this say? This states very clearly that the state has failed, that the government has failed. You have failed your people. This is why I kept telling the House, I kept telling the Chief Minister, you have to rectify this because this will have ramifications and consequences. But they did not listen. They would always come to the house and say, yes, you're very right. We will do the best. We will rectify wherever necessary. They would always, you know, accept that there is a fault line and they would rectify it. But they never did so. Only in 2021 did the chief minister stand up and say, I have formulated a rationalization committee whereby the chief secretary of the state is the chairman. And within a month or two, we will do this rationalization and we will make sure that all of these teachers and doctors that go to the hills, they will remain there. Now, what is the follow-up after that? I lost the elections in 2022. He has never kept his word. It's such actions that the people should hold the governments accountable. When you declare in the house that I will make sure I will take care of this and you just don't care two hoots about going back on your word, then what, what, what is the answer to that? So... I have tried. I have tried everything I could to try and rectify this present government. Many a time people say the Congress did this or did not do this. I was not an MLA before 2017. You cannot hold me accountable for an action 
which was taken or not taken. If I am to apologize for all deeds that the Congress party has done, mm -hmm. I would not be contesting today again. Mm -hmm. Because this is not the way systems are followed. This is exactly the reason why I'm saying if there are mistakes of the Congress in the past, he had his opportunity in five years plus two years now, mm -hmm. that's seven years time, which he has assured in the House, the government would have easily means easily done whatever was necessary. At least start with the assurances that you gave in the House, that you told the people that you would rectify. The healthcare and education system, you could have made. I always ask for a district cadre system, rationalize the teachers and the doctors so that you cannot transfer them in and out at will. This is what the Honorable Chief Minister agreed to in 2021. But I see no movement and I see no action taken till date, which means since the beginning till now, there is no interest in doing this. So how does one rectify this? You can only rectify this when by law it is done. The law since 1971, when Article 371 was inserted, Article 371C was inserted into the Constitution, once this was done, and the presidential order of June 20, 1972 came out. The law is enforced from the day it is introduced. So this law has been enforced since 1972. Mm -hmm. I am not asking or demanding anything. I am executing my right as a legislator as per powers delegated by the union government within Article 371C. Now, when I say that I am delegated, I am mandated, it means that my mandated duty means I can do all of these legislations to this level. Why is it that the state, they shied away if that bill that I introduced was ultra-virus to the government or to the constitution? They would have easily said this is, you know, by law not acceptable, introduced in the House and rejected. They have not done it, which means that legally, technically, it is not wrong. We live in a world whereby within laws, within the confines of laws, we have to work as legislators and as parliamentarians. Mm -hmm. What does the law say? It says very clearly that the Hill Erase Committee is mandated with these particular subject matters. One being the constitution powers and functions of the Autonomous District Council is a scheduled subject matter of the Hillary's Committee. Mm -hmm. It is your mandated duty. And if you do not use it, then what is your purpose to your electorate? And if you want to use it, and I say no, then who am I cheating? It's your electorate directly that I'm reflecting on. Mm -hmm. So our people need to understand the reality and the nuances of exactly what electoral politics is all about. India says very clearly, that it is legislative supremacy under which India functions, be it the state or the center. This being a reason within the confines of law, very much within the confines of legality, this bill was made and introduced and tabled unanimously mm. by the Hillary's committee. Mm. That is, the BJP is there, the NPP, the NPF, so is also the Congress. Mm. All the four parties that were existing, that were in existence at that point of time, all four unanimously recommended that this bill be introduced and be made an act. It was not even introduced. What does this say? This says that you can bulldoze through anything. No, we are here. Our forefathers have been here. We have been living at, in peace. We have been living together as one. All these generations and these decades and these millennia. Why is it that all of a sudden you jump up and say that no, you have no right? I have always had this inherent right. Mm -hmm. And the law today says that this is your right. When the law says it is my right, and I am being stopped from executing my mandated right, what does this say? It means there is no scope for discussion. In a democracy, you have to discuss, you have to debate, and accordingly get about the best. For example, today, going out of context, I'll be very clear. We have our brethren in the, in the valley asking for ST. Mm -hmm. It is very much their right. Within the Constitution, their right to demand for it. See? Now, is it my right to say yes or no? There are two factors here. What does the law say? Do the parameters of the law in the demand for ST say that you have to take the recommendation of the Tankul community? No, it does not. Nowhere is it said that you have to take the recommendation of your fellow brethren. You have to take your neighbors. No, it doesn't. It is for him to demand and it is for the center to give or not give. Mm -hmm. So why is my opinion important? It is not. 
By law, there is no relevance in Alfred recommending or not, saying yes or no. There is no relevance at all about Alfred, but it is very much his right to ask. If he wants to ask, it is for him to ask. It is the right for him to ask. Now, when you come back to Article 371C, it is not my right. It is not even, I am not even asking. It is my mandated duty because that right has already been given to the Hillary's committee. Mm. See? So when you are stopping that right, what does this say? It speaks volumes. So in a civilized society and in a society like Manipur that we live in, a small society, mm. if you go back to time in the 80s, when this whole agitation of the eight schedule was happening, do you think the hills did not join this? We joined it, saying that it is very much part, a lot of, that there was a compromise on this, that we would give the hills six schedule mm. and the valley would be given eight schedule for us. The day eight schedule came, six schedule was forgotten totally. You cannot function as a community, as a people. You have to see the interests of one and the other, supplement each other. Then that is what you call brothers. Emotionally also, technically also, legally also, legislatively also, you have to work understanding the difficulties and the nuances of what we are all about. But when you put your foot down and say that even such things like a mandated right that has already been given to the Hilly Race Committee, if you want to bulldoze and stop this, where is the next step then? Emotionally, the people will break up. Once the emotionally we, we disintegrate, what is the future of our people then? See, you have to understand what the law says and within the confines of that law, how much can we discuss and how much can we negotiate and exactly what it is that our people want to achieve through this. This is why that mandated Article 371C bill, HAC bill of last year, this is something which the state government should be held accountable, not me, neither the Hillary's committee. It is the state. The people should hold accountable the state. In fact, our valley brethren should you know, go to the chief minister and tell the CM, why did you not do this? This is the law. When the law says this, why are you not tabling it? Why did you not introduce it? It is people like you that are you know, having no semblance of law. You are doing whatever you are doing at your whims and fancies. Everybody functions within the law. And the chief minister is functioning within the powers of Article 166. Article 66 is what the chief minister's powers are derived from. What does Article 371C say? What does the Hillary's Committee order say? Hillary's Committee order is very clear. It very clearly says that Article 371C, the provisions of this, this supersedes Article 166. Mm -hmm. When this law supersedes Article 166, it means this supersedes the powers of the chief minister with regard to the scheduled subject matters. And with this scheduled subject matter, constitution powers and functions of the Autonomous District Council is one such scheduled matter. This is why you, nobody can function outside the purview of law. So also the chief minister and the cabinet council of Manipur. This is all I'm saying. Thank you. Okay, so I think we can establish the fact that when it comes to the Meitei's demand for ST inclusion, you're neither opposed nor supporting it, but you do recognize their right to demand for it. Something that is given by law for them to ask, who am I? If right. the law says, you have to ask Alfred. Mm -hmm. I will give my opinion that time. Okay. Not now. Right. It becomes political. Mm -hmm. You cannot ask my opinion when it's not going to matter when they are going to decide. You cannot make it political. It has to be legally and technically right. Once it is legally and technically right, then I can become political then. So you cannot just speak politics and legally, technically, I am not required. Nobody is required for them to ask for ST. So when the requirement comes and the government of India, they feel that it is a requirement to ask Alfred or Yozori, that day, I'm sure you and me, we will both give our opinions. Isn't it so? Right. So would your answer be the same in regard to the cookies asking or demanding for separate administration? What's your take on that? In a democracy, everything happens by discussion and deliberation. It's a small state, a very small state. Mm. What is the reason as to why the cookies are demanding separate administration today? I would say, I would go back to the very factor that my Kankui Primary Health Center has one doctor. You go to Nambol, right? You go to the primary health centers, community health centers in the valley, you'll see the stark difference. When you see the reality of this, there is a saying that all the people are not fools, you see? Nobody, you see, all the people are, are, aren't. 
There is rationality within people. Mm. A time comes when people lose patience. Right. Everybody loses patience, you know, some time or the other, at one point or the other. So the question here is, what made this come about? I don't expect the nation or the state of Manipur to suddenly say that the cookies were suddenly airdropped in 2023, uh, April, and in May, they demanded separate administration. I would not. Ukhrul, we have, uh, you know, about 4,500 square kilometers of area, which our ancestors have left us. I'm 50, I'm 50 plus now. As far as I remember, the Mongkotchepu, Litan Sarekong, Shankai, Zelenbung, uh, Songmun, pa sorry, it's not Songmun, Pashong is a, it's a, you know, offshoot of Pashong, this Songmun. So Pashong, these villages have been there as far as I remember. When I've asked my father, who is 98 and he's still alive today, hail and hearty and kicking, he also tells us, no, these villages were all there from that time. He's hitting 100. Mm. And he also says they were there. Now, when India was given statehood, uh, sorry, uh, independence, mm. when India became a republic, all of these tribes and communities that were here at part and parcel of Manipur, when Manipur merged with the Union of India in 1949, do you think there were no cookies settling in, in Manipur at that point of time? All these villages, maximum of them were there. New villages, see, the people will have controversy to many things that your opinion would change and mine also would differ. Mm. But yet, you cannot question the fact that the cookies were not settling in Manipur when India was granted independence or when India attained independence or when Manipur merged with the Union would the Metes of our valley or the Nagas of the hills say that there were no cookies when Manipur merged with the Union? No. Nobody can deny that fact. Mm. So what has brought this about today, this separate administration demand? Why did Manipur not take it seriously when I said, I have no, I am not sympathizing with either the cookies or the Nagas or the Metes, anybody. Mm. All I'm saying is basic humanity. What does it say? The elected government should be held accountable, not the community. It's not the Mete community, not the Kuki community, but the elected. It is the elected that represent the communities or the people. What does the very word representative mean? It means you represent something. It is not your right, but you represent the people. So when those aspirations of those people, which I so vociferously in the house brought about, this disparity has to be addressed. How many times I kept harping on this? People thought that they can just keep playing with it and not address it. Mm. I would not give a justification as to how and why the cookies are asking for separate administration. But my reasoning would be the ADC bill, the entire concept, the entire reasoning for why the ADC bill is a must today is because the government is not at all serious. The government has no intention. So when the government has no intention, what happens then? It is only by law that you can secure your rights. What does India say? India says so very clearly that anybody, everybody can ask whatever is legally right. So the cookie is asking for separate administration. They are, if they are within the confines of the constitution, they are very well within their rights. Mm. Now, how does one convince them or talk to them or discuss with them? You're asking me this. You should be asking this to the government, you see. Mm. We have tribal MLAs, we have Naga MLAs, we have Naga ministers in the government. Have they at all gone once to Churachampur or to Kangpokpi, spoken to KOTU, ITLF, spoken to the MLAs together, mm. sat together and said, you know, look at our relationship. You go back to 1949, go back to pre-1949, look at the time of the Maharaj, look at the time during British era. This intricate detail of how Manipur was woven by our ancestors. Why would you want to break this? These sort of detailed discussions has anybody initiated, has the government initiated, whereby the public can be informed, the Kuki public as well as the Naga public, as well as the Manipur Valley public, be the Muslims or the mainland Indians or the Metes. You need information to understand that the government is actually working towards ensuring that the state stays united and peaceful. Has the government done this? I, from my side, I have not seen. So if the government is not initiating, who would say that the cookies have no right to demand separate administration? Because if they are asking for this, 
that is within the confines of law. Like I said earlier, it's within discussions and communications. Mm. Now, how do you communicate in such a way that they also are assuaged of their fears and that mm. why don't you come on board? We are a small place. We have to work together. Who is doing this? You cannot set up a peace committee that you select. People are, people are looking at you, you see, as the person who is orchestrating this whole exercise of bringing about this turmoil in the state. When you, people are pointing fingers at you that you are the person, and you come out with a committee which has the footprint and handprint of you and you yourself only. Then would people trust you? They would not. Be open-hearted. Let your, let your heart be open. Let your, you know, mind be clean. Without any hidden agenda, reach out to the communities concerned and go and discuss and talk to them. Your ministerial team has never once, no, the state has never seen a single time, a single minister from the state of Manipur going to Churuchampur or Kangpopi. So if you continue doing this, this question of the cookies asking for separate administration, what does the law say that I can do? I can only ensure that we stay united emotionally as a people. I can speak to people, I can speak to Metis, I can speak to Nagas, I can speak to Kukis and say that what does our destiny you know, consist of? Do we have a common goal? Do we have common agendas? Do we have aspirations that are consensual in character or in you know, content? Do we have a desire that we can all go forward together as one? These are things that I can do as an individual or as a part of a community through discussions. But I cannot tell the cookies, you have no right to demand what is within the constitutional right of yours. I cannot. The law does not say that. But I have every right also to oppose. I have every right also to oppose saying that no, I will allow this. Or I will allow, allow this. So, But then what does that say? It says I am also going against the constitutional right of a particular party. So for them to ask, is their right? So is also the right of other communities also to say yes or no. Okay, so going back to the necessity to bring about equity, justice, and equity development, and tying in there the the current situation that we have that we've discussed just now, because if you look at your constituency, parliamentary constituency, you've mentioned it too. We have different communities living in the uh, in one constituency, and so you have to also take care of you know the the well being of all the stakeholders involved. I think you've already mentioned this too regarding inclusivity. You you strive for inclusivity, and like you've mentioned earlier, uh, it's all about trying to come up with say a desire which will be um, agreeable for everybody involved, right? But um, since you talked about un unity and trying to maintain unity for the state, I want to mention this one term: Manipur integrity. This is something that you have uttered, I think, in your previous either campaign speech or in the assembly. Uh, people are questioning, especially because you've also talked about Naga mm. issue, the long-standing Naga issue. And you're, you're all for it, but at the same time, you're for money for integrity. So the question is, how does that work? On the one hand, you're here supporting the Naga demand, and the, on the other, you have this money for integrity. How does that work? See. One has to understand exactly where you are positioned, where you are located, where you are situated. What is the core emotional idea of Manipur? It lies in unity. A unified Manipur, a unified people is what people talk about. The question here is this integrity, the question integrity, what does this signify? You have to be very clear on this. Without emotional integrity of our people, the land cannot be united. The land cannot be integrated under any circumstances. The law says, Article 3 is clear in the Union of India. This says, at any point in time, India can make a state bigger or smaller. I have expressed my desire very clearly in the house, you see, that we as a people, we stay integrated. We are here to ensure our people stay integrated. That is integrity of the people. When I speak in the assembly, I cannot go against directly Article 3. I cannot challenge Article 3. Mm. And I cannot say I will sit and I will stand for the integrity. I challenge Article 3. I cannot do that. The moment I do that, the very sanctity of the house is in question. The government of India can even dissolve the house. You cannot challenge the constitution. 
You can pass resolutions saying that we would like that Article 3 be amended. So many times, this, these resolutions have been passed. Unanimity, with unanimity, that is, um, all the members of the House, 60, irrespective of party affiliation, Nagas, Kukis, Metes, Muslims, everyone put together. Resolutions have been passed saying, we are requesting the union government to amend Article 3 when a settlement comes about for the Naga political issue. Mm. That is the resolution that can be adopted by the House. What I said, and I maintain again, what I said is very clear. All I said is integrity of this, which means the people, integrity of the people is a must for a people to move forward the people need to stay integrated. It is the people that need to stay integrated. But please do not connect everything. You cannot just connect dots where there are no connections. Land and the integrity of a state, the land, the state integrity of a state, you know, as per constitutional provision, the union has powers to do whatever they want at any point in time. That is the powers of the union. Since our forefathers, since the generations and generations and generations, we have lived together, integrated as a good and loving people, yeah. be it the valley and the hills. Mm. I was expressing that so very clearly, mm. that we need to stay integrated. We are integrated. I am here to stand for the integrity of our people. Mm. But the course of action that the union government takes in the event that the Naga political issue reached, reaches its conclusion, if at all such a point comes, and then they ask, what is the opinion of Alfred? I will give my opinion then. I don't need to give my opinion now. I have never given my opinion today saying, what exactly is it that Alfred will do? They are, they are fighting for my people. The NSN I am, who will deny this fact that they are fighting for my people? Mm. All of these generations they have been fighting, they're not fighting against me or against anybody. They are fighting for our people. The common cause of all our people, the youngsters, the elders, for everybody, yeah. for a good future. These discussions are being held at the government of India level. Started in Amsterdam, at the prime minister's level. At a much higher level, it's happening. Who am I to, to ever at any point in time go against discussions that are happening with the Union of India, of which Manipur is also a part of? I have no right to go against that. The only thing I can do is hope and pray that at the earliest, you see, the best possible solution comes. Whatever it is that the Union is going to give, that is preview between the Union of India and the NSCN I am or the Naga national political groups. They are with discussions with them, not with us. Neither is it with the state government. Neither is it with any of the, the common, common people in the state of Manipur. So, me supporting the Naga political issue, why would I not? This is a desire that each and every single person, you know, desires and aspires for. What do you have? You see uh, Uncle Muiva himself stating very clearly. He says, the Valley Metes and the Nagas, we have always been living together as a people. We have to move forward together as a people. These are their words, it's not my words. He is the one that is leading the cause and fighting. Everybody has their own, you see, desire for their people. I am nobody to say you are right or wrong. These are discussions that are happening with much bigger entities. And they have a right to do this. This is why the union has initiated these talks. And I pray and hope that at the earliest the talks conclude. Now, what will be the final conclusion in those talks? And I cannot be privy to that. And I cannot say it will be A or B or C. But my desire, my aspiration of speaking in the house, emotionally bonding with our people in the state, be it with the Metes, be it with the Muslims, be it with the Cookies, and be it with our Naga people, that... Whatever be the case, we have to live as one, integrated as a people. These boundaries, all of these boundaries, administrative boundaries that are made today. For example, do you mean to tell me that Silent Village or Mapau Village or Homan Village, these are all Tangkul Villages. So since there are administrative boundaries that have made them now today part of Kang Pokpi, do you mean to say that their ancestry also says that they were always part of Kang Pokpi? No. These are boundaries that have happened after India's independence and after Manipur was given statehood. So integrated as a people, what, what would the next state, what would the next step be? You integrate as a people, and then once you are close-knit and tight as a people, then you understand exactly what is the desire and wishes, excuse me, aspirations of the people, 
and you move together as one body. So I was very clear in telling the house. This is why at that point in time when I told the house, I am here, you know, for the integrity of the state. I am here so very clearly. Then why is it that would, you would not want to discuss an issue which is dear to me, an issue which concerns me, concerns my people? Why would this house not want to discuss? Do you only want to discuss things that are close to you, that you like? You have to discuss ugly things, things that you do not want to discuss. You have to discuss. You have to bring it forward, discuss it, and then bring about closer, closure, how much we can help. You cannot just speak, we are brothers, we are brothers, and not want to address issues that have been prevalent to us for the last close to a century. You have to open your eyes. The people have to say, yes, we are mature enough to discuss such issues. We are mature enough because we are one people. And as a people, we need to discuss exactly what it is that we want and how best we can move forward as a people. This has to come about by discussion. And if you're not even willing to discuss this, what does this say? It says you have resentment for our people. I would say that at least the valley does not have resentment for our people. This is why I want to discuss, I wanted to discuss it. But the very attitude of not wanting to even discuss and bring, you know, bring about a common you know, consensus resolution for the interests of the Naga political cause, if they are not interested in discussing, it means that the present government of that day, they had no sympathy to the Naga common cause. Okay, speaking of inclusivity, um, I think we've touched on all of those major issues, including... Our constituency as well. Does that put you, not just you in particular, but the candidates and whoever is going to be elected in a tight spot because they have to take care of all of these things well within the law? There cannot be two ways. But let me hold back a little bit here. Let me give a little bit here. No. First and foremost, hold the government accountable, bring them to task and ensure that permanent peace prevails among communities. This is a duty of the government. The basic principle of democracy, of an elected, what does this say? It says protecting the life and property of citizens. This is the basic fundam fundamental principle of a democracy, elected democracy. Are they doing this today? You go to the relief camps in the valley, you will see, you see the elderly ladies or the youngsters who are saying, we may have nothing, but the little bit that we have, everything is there in the villages that we have left our memories and our everything there. So the only desire that they have, they also say, we have nothing in Imphal Valley. Oh, everything that our fathers left us, our parents left us, is all there in Surachanpur, or is all there in More, wherever, or in Kangpokpi. Where do we go today? We have nowhere to go besides the relief camp. Can you at least ensure that we go back to where we are supposed to live? Mm. And we, where it is our mandated fundamental right to live. You go to Churachanpur, it is the same thing. Especially the women and children, they are very clear. What they call home is not relief camps. They have their homes. They have no property at all anywhere else. So their only home is the home that they call the villages. The small, you see, mud house that they have or a thatched roof that they have, that is their home. Some have buildings. Majority rural areas, they have, you see, GI sheet roofs, most of them, some of them, they have touch roofs. They want to go back there. How do you ensure that our people go back? Our people, I mean the valley as well as the hills. How do you ensure that they go back to the respective places and they live, you see, as one? How, how is one going to do this today when you have sown the seeds of discord, discord? The leader, you cannot control this. You're not controlling it. You should have resigned 10 months back. Not taken back your resignation and said that, hold me accountable. I am the person that has allowed this to happen. I'm sorry. But our people need to live and work together as one. Unite. Our people, please unite. And had he done this, you think the state of affairs would be this today? It would not be. You think the cookies would continue, you know, with their vociferous demand of separate administration? When you have a leader who feels that he's bigger than the law, nobody is bigger than the law. So, the moment one is elected, either the valley or the hills, you have to take the government to task, that is the state and the central government both, and you have to make sure 
that they pave way. They have to move aside. Without them moving aside, there is no question of peace and justice coming to both the communities that have been affected by this conflict. Okay, so first thing to hold them accountable and then to make sure that you bring about or it, you ensure that all of their desires I and mean, the stakeholders' desires are you know, taken care of. But the problem again is I think there are as many aspirations. The aspirations are as diverse as the communities within. But how tough do you think it would be for the elected representative to be able to do that, to bring about such change? See, Yozori, uh, you recollect that in 1896, you are from Hunpun, when Reverend William Pettigrew first came. Mm -hmm. We were as close as can be to savages. We were headhunters. Mm -hmm. Besides our lineage of the little culture and customs that we followed, we knew nothing of the outside world. The question here is, how did William Pettigrew penetrate our people? And today, 100% of Tankuls are Christians. Mm. How did that happen? See, one day at a time. There is no question called impossible in this world. Nothing is impossible in this world. If you prefix the word, the word impossible, then the word called democracy also would not be there. And neither would the elected be there. Like I said earlier, everything is possible by discussions and by deliberations. How do you do that? You need the right people. There are four of us contesting today. You have Amit Timothy, you have uh, Tak Hojwan, you have my friend Alison, and I am there. Everybody has an equal right to represent our people. No one is above or below the other. It is for the people to decide. Everybody is committed, I would say that. Now, you just need among the four of us, whoever is elected, the right person. God wills it and the people will it, the right person would come. And if the right person comes, the Nagas today are seen as a neutral party to this entire you know, conflict. Yeah. I'm grateful to God and to our people, to the Naga people also, that we neither took sides this time. That today we are in a position to actually bring about both sides to for a discussion, at least to start a discussion somewhere. You see the demand of our Chin Kuki Zo brethren. From day one, they've been asking for the removal of the present Chief Minister Biren. I don't know what it is. You have 40 legislators from the valley. You have 20 from the hills, 10 Nagas. So you have 50 currently who are not part of the Kukizo dispensation. Why is it that are the remaining 49 so incompetent? This first step should have been initiated long, long back. At least the first step to ensure that, okay, I have done one part. Now you come one step. If this is not initiated, there can be no discussions. There can be no talks. So whoever is the elected this time, especially the one winning from the hills, since all four are Nagas, the core issue would be to, you see, shoulder the responsibility of trying to hold accountable whoever is on the wrong side of the fence. The Valley MP, you cannot blame him for any reason, whoever is elected, he would be elected and he would be, since he is already part of this conflict, you have the Metis and the Cookies on either side. So you would always be seen as taking one side yeah. because you are from that community. So. I guess by my saying that, in a way, would you know, uh, directly say that the NPF candidate should not be voted for because they are a common candidate for the BJP and NPF. But I would not say that. I would still say that Amit Amiti is a good man. He has uh, seen the ups and downs of life. So be it from the NPF, be it independence, or be it from the Congress, everybody has this aspiration and desire to actually ensure that something good comes about whoever is elected. There are three things that I would like to make very clear here. To do about right, if you're going to do what is right, then you have to have truth. Without truth, you cannot do the right thing. You have to have truth to execute what is right. And to possess truth, one has to be courageous again. If you're not courageous, most people, they know it is right, but yet you want to lay off. 
So in this day and age, everybody says, it's better that I stay away from this. Let me just keep quiet and stay silent. This is not a time to remain silent. Speaking of the government's failure to contain the, con the conflict, um, I just want to mention the fact that the prime minister recently made a claim regarding um, the, the quote would be a timely intervention from the center and the government's effort uh, bringing about improvement in the state condition. How would you like to reply to that statement? It's, a, it's such a bold statement. Timely intervention. Yeah, that's what he said. I think this is something that is a favorite line of the BJP. They love to say this. I have never politicalized things in my life, especially something as serious as this. What does he mean by timely intervention when, you know, uh, farmers are tilling their fields and they are shot dead by either side? You see, when you have people who are quietly going about their, their normal chores in life mm -hmm. and suddenly from nowhere armed persons come armed persons come in and they totally you know finish you and your family off is this timely intervention what what happened on the third what happened on the fourth what happened on the fifth what happened for so many days con continuously is that their idea of timely intervention i really do not uh, i think they must have you know started a new vocabulary Okay. This timely intervention, it must be from their side, their, their own way of, you know, meaning you, you should have a new dictionary, not the Oxford or the Webster's dictionary, but you should have the RSS Nagpur dictionary. I think their, their form of dictionary, I think that is their lingo. Okay. Well, you speak very highly of your, say, your competitors for this election. Um, and when it comes to people trying to decide whom to elect, uh, for you in particular, because you had been in a position where you were people's representative at one point and you had the opportunity to bring about change. So this time, I won't ask you to quantify your achievements, but my question would be rather in your tenure as an MLA, um, would you say that you did a good job? Uh, were you, how much of your goals and, uh, and, and aspirations were you able to attain during your tenure? And were there times and instances where you felt like you could have done better? Yozuri, you need an informed people. An informed people, by that, what I mean is the electorate should be an informed people, at least with regard to the rights that they have, and at least possess the basic knowledge to understand what exactly it is, you see, uh, for a legislator to perform one's duties. When you expect more from a legislator than what is his mandated duty, you will get disappointed. As a human being, yes, I would say there are instances whereby some cases, I would say, some stray cases whereby I could not address issues of healthcare and education of individuals. The duty that I was mandated to take up for our people I held that at very high esteem. A single day, I have not compromised. I have not means I have not. Be it for power, be it for money, be it for anything. I have never compromised. It may be nothing, but today if you go to our district hospital in Ukrul, I know exactly what it was when I first came in. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, when I left, when the people felt that I didn't do enough, it is the people who have decided. Mm -hmm. And I would clearly say, okay, no problem. But the people would know whether we have the basic infrastructural human resources as well as the machineries in the district hospital itself. Mm -hmm. I can very well guarantee that many means many, many of our, you know, our population today, they are, their, their health issues are addressed at the district level which could have been done 20 years back, 30 years back. But mm. I'm grateful that mm, at least uh, with the basic uh, fundamentals of the district hospital, at least one, two parts that was addressed. The other part, if you go to Pettigrew College, 
I don't know what, what one would call parameters for <clears throat> change or achievement or targets. But you should go and speak to the students, the faculty, speak to the people around there, the residents there, and ask them. You should not be asking me, actually. It is those people. This is why I say our people should be an informed community. They should be the ones speaking out. But why is it that our people are so... Uh, I don't know how to put this for, for, forward this word. But the, is it that our people are all introverts? They are not so. When it comes down to our festivals, then you see all of our the beauty of our people across our, our, our district. But the change that is prevalent in particular college, when I first went there, I could see just six, seven students, 10 students. And that also, whether they attend class or not, it was 5% of what a college life should be all about. Slowly but surely, I put my head there. I put my time there. I put all my energy there. I must have visited Pediguru College at least close to you know, 70, 80 times. And nothing was put up on social media. I was visiting, visiting. I, I didn't do that. I kept going, I kept going, I kept going, you know, making sure that the entire system of imparting education was indeed quality-based. Trying to ensure, trying to put in desire among the, the faculty also, the desire to actually bring back to life the institution that was named after the first missionary in Manipur. So I kept interacting with them, like I said in the beginning. You know, constant interaction and discussions, it brings about permanent peaceful change, inclusive growth. Mm -hmm. So what is the result in Pettigrew College today? I took our Pettigrew students to Churchanpur, made them go and see Churchanpur College, and see this is also a hill district and look at how vibrant their college life is. You could see thousands. You had the principal who went into, uh, I think we went to a class. Class was going on and full classroom, about a hundred students. Principal said, what is this? What is happening here? Is it some seminar? Then one of the teachers said, no, it's the first sem geography. So principal said, but these students are more than the total number in my college. This is exactly what the principal said. Today, you go back to Petigru. I am sure each Tankul, forget me, each student there, the pride that the students would have, I think it would be not less than 1,300, 1,000 to 1,500, the students that are enrolled in Petigru today. Every year you have 500 new students enrolling. So if you have 500 new students enrolling from first sem to sixth sem, it means you have at least 1,500. So 1,200 to 1,500 is my guess, would be the present strength in Pedigree College. You go during college hours. It's like an actual college that you see in Delhi University. You go to Calcutta. All these colleges, our people also deserve this atmosphere that of what campus life is all about. Mm. So at least that I know I've done. Okay, I think uh, it won't be wrong to say that one of your priorities uh, was education and also healthcare. And like you've mentioned, the Ukhruk District Hospital and the Pedigree College, they're like testaments to what you've done so far. Uh, but I'd also like to mention, since we're in this topic, um, I think you were quite, you have this, or maybe you had, I don't know if you still have it, you had a very grand vision regarding enhancing local economy. And um, you talked about, this was very a very passionate appeal from your end when you were campaigning in the past regarding the concern of the mass exodus of our uh, able youth to other states to earn their livelihood. And you made a very tall promise there, talking about how you, you were going to bring back all, I'm not sure if you said all, please correct me if I'm wrong, but maybe most of them back home to, you know, enhance our local economy, which I know where it's coming from. I mean, why, why won't you do that if we had the ability to? Because why won't we build our own economy when we really need to and we have the resources to? But then again, what happened to that? What happened to that promise? Like I told you, duty of a legislator. You take this both ways. There are two sides to this. On my part, I did a duty which is mandated by the people. You go back to the first session, budget session of the Manipur Assembly. I was very clear in that. I told the Honorable Chief Minister, I told the Horticulture Minister also, 
Why are you putting these sort of budgets for the hills? Why don't you put in 300 crore for the hills with regard to horticulture? Mm. You put in 300 crore and you will see in the next three, four years how the economy of the hills will change, how this will emp empower the entire state, how the per capita income of the state will change. Every single core area I questioned in the assembly to make, see, the only thing I felt and which I realized and which I knew very clear at that point of time was when I, have, when I had proposed and put in progressive, inclusive ideas, the government was duty bound to oblige. Mm -hmm. They never did. They are not interested. This was the reason why Amit Shah and myself, we had a heated argument when the Hill MLAs had gone to visit Amit Shah with regard to the 2021 ADC bill. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, I told him, look at the budget of horticulture, the hills. We have 90% of the, of the land. Mm. We are dependent on agriculture and horticulture. And look at the budget. Five crores for the hills and 50 crores for the valley. If this is the case, so. How do you expect our youngsters to actually have employment? One. The most important part of this, Yozori, is uh, your grandfather, our William. My father is very close to him. I have known him personally. Our William was educated. His father, your great grandfather, I'm sure was not. So now, where am, where am I getting to? Where does our strength lie? Where does the strength of our people lie? The entire hills. What sort of a community are we? We are a farming based community. Our strength is farming. Farming does not mean you're a farmer. Look at the bigger term. I have in laws in England who are farmers, they are millionaires. Would you say that they're not earning, you see, a, a respectable life? They're not having a respectable life? They are. Ukhrul has just a small example. Ukhrul has 4,500 square kilometers, let us assume. What are our educated youth today? Educated youth, let us say, is 20% of that population. 2 lakh population, 20%, 40,000. 4,000 square, square kilometers, 4,500 square kilometers, 40,000 educated youth. It's not that you're going to have 40,000 coming and becoming farmers, all of them. No. Where is our strength? Where are our core sectors? How do you build our villages? What is your heritage? What is it that you will leave for your future? We cannot be like the Red Indians. Mm -hmm. We cannot, that you don't know what your history is, what your future would be because you're a people without land. At least I'm grateful to our ancestors. I'm grateful to the Union of India for having formulated and then inserted Article 371C, having protected our custom by law, having protected our land by law. What does the law say? I'm from Shangshak, you're from Hunpun. My right as a Tankul over land, over resources, over my custom, over my culture, over my tradition. It ends with my village. Everything ends with my village. Mm -hmm. So my history is my village. My entire history is my village. So when you have our entire youth who have exoded from, you know, their total exodus is there. When they have left, they will know nothing about the value of what their village means. If their village would mean nothing to them in 20 years, 30 years from now, the village system would crumble. There would be no history left. Mm. This has to be protected. That is one reason why youngsters have to come back. For them to come back, you need employment. Mm. To employ them, what do you do? It is the duty of the state. It is not the duty of that educated youth to run around for employment, no. It is the duty of the state. The state means, I don't mean state government. The state means the powers that be, be the central or the state government. Mm. What did Modi keep ensuring? He said, two crore jobs in a year. It's 10 years. Has he provided 20 crore jobs? If he comes to my village, you will see the stark reality of what being employed actually means. There is zero employment in the hills. So what I meant and what I was very clear of and exactly why I kept pushing the state government and telling them the people should have held the state accountable. Our people don't even know the basic principles of democracy, legislature, executive, and judiciary, the separation of powers. It is the duty of the legislature to hold the executive 
you see, accountable and responsible. That was exactly what I did. The whole state saw. Instead of holding the state, the government accountable, you removed all of us from office, the people who are holding the government accountable. This is the government that you get today, full of conflict. You have nothing but conflict everywhere. So I was very clear. All of this I said in the assembly, saying that unless you bring about these changes, you cannot just say that we will stay united when the people don't have anything to eat, when the people don't have employment, when the people don't have you know, the basic principles of what we call educating our people, healthcare for our interior areas. All of these things are so very important for us to stay as a people. The state failed in five years. I kept asking again and again and again. When I brought the bill in August 2021, then the chief minister immediately started saying, oh, he wants to break up the state. If I do my mandated duty as a Hill Erase Committee within the powers that have been delegated to me by law, then, and you point fingers at me, then what is it? Then what is it that the state is doing? Any law that a state, state makes, will we say that you're trying to break up the state? It has to be within the confines and parameters legally and technically. And that I was clear on. So I gave enough opportunity to the state to bring about all of these legislations to bring about, you know, the parity of how our youth could come back, could be employed, would till our land, would make sure that we go into farming, be it horticulture, be it agriculture, allied sector, so many things, integrated farming system, to open up MSMEs, small scale industries, forestry. This is our core strength. The land is ours, but we have nothing to grow on. It is the duty of the state to ensure that our people are, are you know, employed. They cannot even provide us our basic right to till our land and grow. That is why our people have all left for the cities. And you tell me, you yourself being a Tangkul, you know much better out of the people that are our youngsters that are left to you know, bring about at least a semblance of livelihood for their near and dear ones. Mm. Do you, do, you, do you mean to tell me that 100% all of them are doing, you know, good paying jobs in, you know, public sectors or organized sectors, in private sector too, in, in better paying positions, or in technically good positions? No, 90% are in hospitality sectors where they just earn about enough, thinking that at least we have respect here, that we are earning something. Is it not the duty of the state to ensure that our youngsters come back home and not forget that this is your land, this is your people, this is your village, help your village grow. Is it not the duty of the state to remind us of that? What does the chief minister do? He says, I'm going to give a museum for each tribe. He gave 10 lakhs to each tribe. That also I said in the house, why are you doing this? This is appeasement. Why don't you give, you know, every district, the whole budget for once, three and a half, four crore, give it one district, let them at least build a better, you know, museum. Our artifacts, you know, much better. Our original artifacts, do you think it costs anything less than 5, 10 lakhs today? One Kong Sang, a good Kong Sang. You don't even get it. So what are you going to do with those museums? You're going to, what are you going to keep there? Even in the construction of the, in 10 lakh rupees, you don't even construct a classroom. The present day, Sarva Shiksha Abhyan, or Samagra Shiksha Abhyan, you go and ask them, what is the rate for the construction of one classroom? It will be above 10 lakhs. And you give 10 lakhs saying museum shao, make a museum. Who are you fooling? You, and you're giving that money directly into the account of the, you know, the civil society organization that is the head there. Since they have not seen 10,000, 20,000, 30,000, the presidents, 50,000. You are giving them the money, appeasing them, making them feel that they're important, but finishing off their lives mm -hmm. with that 10 lakhs. What artifacts have they kept there? I would like to question. What history are you going to put in there? Nothing. So, all of this, I know exactly what I said in the assembly. At least I think I've been educated to such an extent that at least I know what the basic principles of what democracy should be about and how you hold the governments accountable. I am not holding communities accountable. I'm holding governments accountable. The government of the day See, there are cookies, there are nagas, there are metes, there are Muslims. Everybody is there in the government. Mm. It is the government's duty. See, just because 
other legislators before me, if they did not say, does it mean I also cannot say? I had every right to, and that's why I exactly said what I had to say. Had the government done what I had requested for, I would not even have needed that ADC Bill 2021. Mm. Then what is the need for that today? Is because our people need to come back. They have to come back. And I cannot trust this government anymore. How do you expect me to trust the government? When they're not even doing basic, basic fundamental right duties. Mm. They are not willing to. So for this very purpose, the only thing that I can do and make sure is that our people, they have to come back and they, have, they really have to come back. How do they have to, how would they come back? For them to come back, you need to ensure that their livelihoods, their way towards the future is there. The state is ready for you. The state is here for you, which I do not see at all from this present government. So the answer to that, in a sense, would be on your part, you did what you could and you should well, within the confines of your function, functionality as a, as a legislator. Hmm. Now, the ball is in the government's court. No, see, the mecha various mechanisms in India is very clear. There are powers given to the state. And if the state does not function accordingly, mm. the person or the institution that can hold them accountable is parliament and the union government. It's very clear. Be it in law and order, be it in any form. There are mechanisms in the constitution that will hold accountable the functionings of government if they are not functioning as per legalities and technicalities. You cannot be political all the time. You cannot. You are bound by laws, and those laws are paramount. So I am not saying that it is in the, in, in the ball of the government. It was their mandated duty, is all I'm saying. And they did not do it. When they did not do it, the people should have held them accountable. But since our people are an uninformed people, is all I'm saying. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying everybody. I'm saying most of our people are informed about what the duty of a legislator is. When you have the chief minister committing that I will make sure that the healthcare and education system is rationalized because to the extent that the chief secretary is now the chairman of the rationalization committee, within a month or two, we will do this exercise and we will make sure that it is fully functional. He committed this in the house and when he goes back on this, the people should hold him accountable. But the people voted him instead of holding him accountable. The people voted NPF who they were part of the government. They should all have been held accountable because that this is what is committed to the people. So my duty as a legislator, I have very well done. When the government does not fulfill, see, if it is a political statement that I'm giving in the house, mm. that the people can decide whether they want to go with it or not. But when it is mandated by law, mm. and when the law says that this is how it should be, and when you have the chief minister himself or the ministers themselves who keep committing in the house, we will do it, we will do it. And they do not do it. It means that they are anti-people. See, when they are anti-people, our people vote for them. This is not what happens elsewhere in, in, in other parts of the country. So I did my part. I did my part of making sure exactly what the intentions of the government was. But I think there was a disconnect between the electorate and me that the people did not understand exactly what I have done, that they wanted to hold me accountable. It is the government that you hold accountable. If I kept quiet, if I did not pull the government to task, and if the government did not commit to what I had asked them to, then they could say that, oh, Alfred is useless. I did my mandate, the duty, exactly what I should have done. I cannot go beyond that. You can't expect me to go out on the streets and start burning and then start agitating. Duty of a legislator is not that. I held the government to task in the floor of the house. They committed that they would do this, 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 this. And if they have not done it, the people should have given them the befitting answer, which the people failed to do. This time, that is why all I'm saying is, I hope and I sincerely pray that the people will say, you are the one that is to be held accountable. He, I brought in provisions by law, which is mandatory. Fundamental right, healthcare, fundamental right, education. This is mandatory. It is mandatory. So I even brought in the percentages. In the house, I said, look at the percentage of my, 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 my district. Look at the percentage of Churchampur, of Chandel, of Senapati, of Imphal East, Imphal West. So we have these many doctors. When we have these many doctors, if I am 7% of the population, and if the population is, uh, if the doctors are 2,000, automatically by population, I get 140. 
140 doctors. Today, what is the strength of Kamjong and Okru put together? I'm sure it will not even be 50, 60. Why? Because you are not going by law. All of the funding by the Union of India, it happens pro rata basis as per population. So when you're getting your funding as per population, it means the dissemination of all these, you know, uh, infrastructures, be it like I'm saying, uh, especially the human resources, the detailment of personnel, it has to be population basis. So when you give it population basis, then we in the district, because the district health society chairman is the DC. Chairman of the district education society is DC again. So all of these mechanisms are inbuilt by the government of India. But all these mechanisms fail when the state refuses to do its duty on its part, because the deputy commissioner is just a part. You see, it's just a wing of the state. He cannot question or counter the state. He is just a functionary of the state. So it is for the state to make sure that the office of the chairman of the district education society or the district health society is fully functional and vibrant, which they have made sure that made it totally redundant today. Totally redundant. So now what is the question here? The whole basis of why exactly all these things are necessary is all written and put on paper. The state refuses to comply with what is to happen. Then what is my duty? Like I said, I've done exactly what I had to do. It is now for the union to actually make sure that basic governance, not contract works, they see the hills as when you make a road, they see that, oh, it's done. Mm -hmm. It's not so. You need infrastructure, and that infrastructure has to be usable. You go to ITI today, you go to Polytechnic today, mm -hmm. you, you go to all these institutions, you will see that it's totally non-functional. Why? You look at every single institution in the hills. Why? Who would be question? You want me to go and question Nagaland government for that? Or do you think I should go and question Meghalaya or Assam government? My duty is to question the government. It, my duty as an MLA, mm -hmm. be it ruling or opposition, mm -hmm. is to bring tough questions before the government. Hold them to task for all parts of the state, irrespective of whether it's the valley, whether it's the hills. But since I am elected from the hills, and there is a particular duty delegated to the Hill Risk Committee, is it not my bounden duty to make sure that it is vibrant and function within the confines of Manipur state? Mm -hmm. It is so. So when I try to ensure that it is functional as part of Manipur state, that also the government wants to stifle and say, no, you cannot. Then what is it I do then? You tell me, you are the elected and you cannot even do your mandated duty. Mm -hmm. Where do you go next? Then? So see, going to parliament was never an aspiration or desire of mine. It's just a journey that I've set up set out from the beginning. I've started out on this journey. I'm moving on this journey and I will ensure the basic principle and that duty mm -hmm. is to ensure that the rule of law is upheld, the government is held accountable and the dissemination of see, decentralization of all powers, making sure whichever is a necessity for the hills. If you look at the powers of in the 2008 amended ADC Act, elections were held in 2010, the 2008 Amended Act is so very clear. There are subject matters, 24, 25 subject matters that have been delegated to the district councils. Are they functional? Totally no. So what did I tell our brothers from the valley? I told them in 2008, when you formulated, when you amended this bill from the original 1971 bill, the third amendment, when you brought it about in 2008, you amended the act and you gave all of these powers, all of these departments to the autonomous district councils. What did you, you know, intend at that point of time? Was it not to ensure that governance, that you were decentralizing power to ensure better governance in the hills? Was it not so? So they replied, yes. So I told them, see, the only thing that was wrong there was you gave them a vehicle, but you all you gave them a best vehicle, a Mercedes. But the problem was that you you told them petrol you cannot put, and there will be no battery. Mm. Because the mechanism for making the vehicle move is not there. This time, all I have done is to make sure that all of these departments that have been given, all of these functions that have been given to the district councils, I have made sure that we are putting petrol also, and we are also putting the battery for it to function. It is not me who gave the vehicle. 
the vehicle the entire state agreed and gave since 1971. And then in 1972, the Hilly Risk Committee order, the state was in agreement. Why did you not oppose at that point of time? Nobody opposed. It is beyond, you know, statute of limitations today. You cannot even go to court because you have said that it's part of the rule or procedure of conduct of business in Manipur Assembly. It's been more than 50 years today. And today you cannot suddenly wake up and say that, oh no, this law we don't want. You have allowed it to function for the last 50 years. And this is not something like Article 370. No, Article 370 is something very different from what is here. This Article 371C, like I said earlier, is nothing new that was introduced for us. It was just a law that made sure that our age-old tradition and our heritage, our custom, our culture, all of this was protected. For that reason, this law was actually initiated and it was. this is why this law was inserted in 1971. So what does this basically mean? It means that at the end of the day, when one does not do one's actual duty as the executive, the head of the executive, that mechanisms are put in place by the Union of India by which you can actually address your issues. This issue, these issues could have been addressed way long, long time back, but they refused to. You think I, I would have desired to uh, contest for parliamentary elections? This was never in my plate. It was never. Today, my people felt that I need to contest. I also felt that, and I so, I so feel today that I need to contest. I need to make sure that there are multiple issues to be addressed today and all of these issues to be addressed, which the state refused to listen, has to be listened to. And this has to be addressed for this state to grow and work as one. Okay, it's interesting that you mentioned um, CSOs because it's no secret, I mean, Alfred, that this time they're backing NPF candidate. How do you feel about this? Two parts to this again. Basic mandated duty of CSOs. I think it's more customary and cultural. Because in India, until and unless your custom and your culture is to be uh, invaded upon, the role of CSOs, at least with the context to Manipur, I think it's a little uh, hazy mm. for them to enter. Mm. Now, the important part here is these elections are parliamentary elections for India's parliament. A member of parliament that is to represent the outer in India. Mm -hmm. Is it part and parcel of the constitution of the CSOs that has made it clear? Anywhere, at any point, mm. they have their constitutions, the CSOs. So is it written anywhere that they would choose who would represent our people in the assembly or in the council or in the parliament? I don't think so. Mm. That is not there at all. I think that is the basic uh, confusion among our people today. Reality and desire. My reality says that today I am living in Manipur. I have to live my reality to make sure that my future is secure. Mm -hmm. The CSOs, they are living the desire. That is the difference. They are living a desire thinking that we are somewhere already. If they feel that Indian elections are important, endorse it then. Bring it part of, make it part of their mm. laws, their constitution, saying that every election, the UNC or the Tangkul Nagalong, we will participate in elections and we will choose which is the best person to represent us in assembly, in councils or in the parliament. Mm. Let us see how our people react to that. Do you think the common citizens, our individuals, mm -hmm. youngsters or elderly alike, would they at any point in time say that you can choose our elected? Nobody would. Mm. They also know what they are doing is unconstitutional to their own constitution, not to the Indian side. Mm. Uh, against the Indian side too, it's, they are totally challenging it. That is different. Mm. But they themselves, their own laws, their own constitutions, it nowhere says that they will choose the elect for India. No and that they will even involve in the election of India. No. So this is why my reality says that this election is for the election of India. Their reality says that it is a desire. We are here to protect our custom, our culture. 
Where is it that the MLA or the MP at any point in time has been mandated and delegated and they have destroyed our culture and custom? Has the CSOs today, has the UNC today, even at any point in time said that our parliamentarian and our legislatures, they have sold out our custom, our culture. This is why now we have to come in to make sure that this is reinforced and that nobody dilutes our custom and culture. Have they at any point? No. Because no MLA or no MP has still date at any point in time gone against our custom or culture. So when that is the case, then what is the intent of the CSOs to do this? Are they directly in cahoots with Biren then? Are they directly supporting him? Mm -hmm. Or is he directly supporting them? One or the other is happening. And for this basic principle, I would appeal to our, our electorate, you know, use your decisions wisely. See, my village is Shangshak. Uh, you can come and ask my villagers. There are NPF, there are BJP, all parties are there. I will tell you very clearly, 98, 99% support me. That is free will, mm -hmm. not coercion, not force. Free will, 98, 99% support me. But because 98, 99% support me, at one election, have we ever imposed saying that, no, you can't come. We are going to vote everything. We have not done this. There are many places who do this, mm. but we have not done this till date. I don't want our youngsters to, at any point in time, start thinking that ah, we can start jumping the gun, do whatever we want, and start you know, mobilizing through shortcuts. There is no shortcut. There is no shortcut to life. And this is exactly the reason why each vote, they have to come and vote, and our CSOs are bound by individuals. The individuals are not bound by CSOs. Without the individuals, without the villages, there would be no CSOs. So the other part that I would like to make very clear to all our youngsters living outside, mm -hmm. irrespective of community, be it Mete, be it Kuki, be it Muslim, be it Naga, because all the electorates, every, every single community, community is there in the electorate, mm -hmm. at least in the outer. I would you know, sincerely ask all of your viewers that they should come. Come for the elections. This is a make or break election. Mm -hmm. Come home, stand your ground, stand firm. You see, you stand firm on the reality that God has given us, the government, the state has given us, whichever is within confines of law, stand your ground, cast your vote, and cast your vote sincerely, not thinking bipartisan, thinking this side or that side. No, be very clear that I am casting my vote thinking that you know, my present, my reality is secure, and my future is not sold out. You cannot live your desire and sell out your present. Mm -hmm. This has to go hand in hand. So this is why this particular election, our youngsters have to come back and make sure that see, CSOs, they are doing their duty. Maybe they're bound by something or someone. I cannot have an answer for that. But the only fact here is without laws, even our customs and traditions, they have laws. These are laws, oral laws that have been given to us with our songs and through word of mouth, this is how our village systems have existed for generations. You mean to tell me that, that, that the CSOs today are willing to override all of this? They are going to discount? Mm -hmm. That means one day they will come up and say that the village laws of Shangshak, I'm going to supersede. They cannot do that. Nobody is above the law. Our custom, our culture is all within confines of our customary and traditional laws. Likewise, these elections are within the confines of Indian laws. So as citizens, all our people, whoever is outside, whoever is in, in the state, whoever are in the villages, are in the you know, respective towns or polling stations, they should all come out and vote, cast to whoever you want. I would prefer that they all vote for me, because very obviously, but if they don't wish to, it's definitely a, a call they have to take, but they have to come home, participate in individual voting, never allow boot capturing or family capturing, that sort of thing, cast your votes individually. And I'm telling you, my God tells me that I have given you a life of free will. They did not give my parents. Even my parents will not decide whether I go to paradise or I go to hell, see, as a Christian. My parents cannot decide. It is me that will decide. It's me and God that will decide where I go. God will decide finally where I go. Likewise, the electorate, you individually will decide who will go. If somebody else decides for you, that is the day things will go wrong. And I think that is exactly the reason why today this is the state of affairs in Manipur. Every person should come out and vote, cast your vote, throw out this government is my open you know, request to 
all the voters. Well, I think it is unfortunate that some people are blindly just following the UNC or the other uh, CSOs. They have their points. They have they have their good reasons as to why they feel like they should um, support or back certain candidate. You can't really compel people to vote for somebody or the other. And you've mentioned how you know all these processes should be well within the bounds of the Indian Constitution. Um, but then, like you said. When it comes to free and fair election, I don't think we have that as of now. Not just now. We haven't had free and fair election for a long time in Manipur. Um, and speaking of which, I just want to mention your campaign. First of all, how is it going, your, your campaign? I had gone to Chirasadpur the other day. But I think I met party leaders and a few CSOs. I think it was okay there. Uh, party cadre are working hard. But I think... Uh, this this particular election is a difficult one mm -hmm. because you have different organizations in the valley also saying that you cannot have uh, PA systems, you, can have, you cannot have large gatherings, all those things. But I don't know whether they're going to actually crack down. I think there is a meeting today with uh, the Home Minister yeah. in Imphal. I think there are going to be thousands and thousands gathered, but I don't know whether they are going to say that no to that. If uh, the same CSOs or the same organizations who said no to all these meetings mm -hmm. and they allow the, the big meeting to happen, then it will say exactly who is, who is what and who is instigating what. So the people should rise as one okay. and come up against such you know, fascist forces. It is a must that the people should rise and make sure that all these anti-social elements, they're done away with. See, why would the CSOs also not have their own reasons? They would have their own reasons. Why not? For example, uh, one very small aspect, one very, very small aspect. One favorite line of political parties, that is the, the ruling class in the, in the ruling party today, mm. one favorite line. They always say Congress ka undoing, Congress ki pattava, Congress ka wrongs and whatever, whatever. Mm. Yes, sad to say, good or bad, I'm in the Congress party. So where do I go? But the fact now here is they have been in power seven years clear seven years. The NPF, BJP, they are together in this, uh, fighting the elections together. It's the NPF contesting, but with the support, open support of the BJP mm -hmm. as a common candidate. Mm -hmm. They even go to the extent of just recently, you know, senior ministers, senior ministers in the government, Naga ministers, they are going on public meetings and saying that the Congress brought Armed Forces Special Powers Act, how we were harassed, brought out of our homes and all these sort of things. Why would I even agree with this? Why would I even you know, say that, yes, yes, I agree with you. I sympathize with you. Why would I support him today? Why should I, when he himself has done nothing mm -hmm. to make sure it is rectified? Mm -hmm. But let me tell you something. In 2021, you remember that Oting incident mm -hmm. where many Nagas lost their lives, civilians. Mm -hmm. One of the first to openly and directly say that this is wrong. Mm -hmm. This is not what I believe is the strength of our Indian army. You cannot kill our civilians brutally like this. Mm -hmm. I think maybe if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, I may have been the only one in, in Manipur among the Nagas who had spoken out so strongly mm -hmm. against such an incident. Mm -hmm. Where were the entire NPF team that time? They should have moved heaven and earth to make sure that Armed Forces Special Powers Act was removed. Mm -hmm. They should have resigned their seats. They talked today that they did this, they did that. Where were they that time? When those innocents were killed, where were they? They were nowhere. And today, they want to have the moral high ground. And they even have the guts, you see, to say that more than 100 days of band was called because the Congress government, they introduced new districts in our Naga areas, administrative districts in our Naga areas. We bifurcated our areas. We gave our areas to different communities, whatever, whatever. Tell me what is the status of that band today? And tell me what is the status of those districts today? Who is in government for the last seven years? Who has allowed for it to function? Who has allowed for it to continue? What is the status presently? What is the status of that band? Then what was the band for then? All I will say thus, sour grapes. You wanted to form government, you wanted to be a minister, you wanted to appoint your people, you wanted to grow as a person. Mm -hmm. Is all I will say that they are. They're all empty vessels make a lot of noise. That is all they are. I challenge, I'm telling you, I challenge NPF people, come. Any discussion table, come. 
I am here openly. I am willing to have a discussion with the entire NPF leadership from Nagaland right till Manipur. Come here. If you have the guts, come. Let us speak on Naga issue. Let us speak on all core issues. Let us see to what extent I have stood firm. And let us see to what extent you have done anything. You have done nothing. You have done nothing. And you, you have the you see, audacity to say that 100 days more than 100 days of ban by UNC. You are cahoots. You are in cahoots with the UNC. That today you have nothing. That ban is nowhere. That issue is nowhere. And the UNC is not even li lifting a little finger. Why? Because you are one and the same. And then every election that comes, you keep shouting this. I am not the Naga because UNC says I am Naga. I am not even a Naga because Tankul says I am Naga. I am not even a Tankul because my people say I am Tankul. I am a Tankul because my forefathers have given me the inherent right to be a villager in my village, Shangshak Phuhan. It is a right that I have inherited. It is not by choice. Nobody has a right to tell me I am Tankul or Naga or not. Today you are choosing, which is selectively saying who is Naga, who is not. How dare you? You have no right, means you have no right to say what my hereditary right is. It is my inherent right. And you also have no right to tell me what my rights and my powers as an Indian are. Today you want to start directing me whether my village is Tankul or not? That is why you are selecting a consensus candidate amongst the Nagas? How dare they? Did my village ever at any point in time say, we have doubt whether we are Tankul or whether we are Naga. We don't know whether we are confused. Has my village at any point in time say, no, it is an inherent right given by my forefathers and reinforced by Indian laws. Indian laws have reinforced my custom, my tradition, my heritage. And I'm a proud person today. I'm a Tankul today because my forefathers made sure that I'm a Tankul today. It is by right that I'm a Tankul. No institution, no organization, nobody, till such time my village boycotts me or my village excommunicates me, has a right to say whether I'm Tankul or not. You go and ask my village, have I done anything wrong to my village till today? I think the answer will be in the negative. I have not. I'm not here to sell out my people. I'm not here to fight my people. I'm here to assert and bring, you know, to justice the rights of my people. And no institution, be it Naga or be it other organizations, nobody has a right to come in between my workings as a pure, pure breach Shangshak Phuhan Tankul to work for the interests of our people. When I want to move on this journey, nobody can say that you are blue or black or white or gray. If the moment he does that, he's questioning my whole village because my heritage is my village. So if you wish to question my whole village, you can, you know, ensure that my village is removed from the Naga villages list. If you can do that, I challenge you because you are bound by custom. You are bound by culture. Your duty is cultural and customary in nature. Today, are you challenging the very existence of my village? Or have I done wrong to our community? No. Do not go beyond the mandate that is given to you by the people. The people have given a particular mandate to the UNC and to the CSOs. Stay within that mandate. Our people will be united. Go outside of that mandate. The people will make sure that you are held accountable. Um, I heard you were invited to the UNC meet uh, in the past where they wanted to talk about consensus Naga candidate. Whatever you've said or stated just now, is that the very reason why you turned down or why you didn't go to that meet? If it is to discuss on customary cultural issues or to do with my village or to do with tankuls, why would I not go? Why would I not go? But when it is to do with Indian elections, to decide what India is all about, where by law he has no mandate, his own law, his own law does not allow him to talk of Indian elections, then how would it be binding on the electorate? These are Indian elections where Indians' laws are binding. You have selected NPF, who is registered with the Election Commission of India. Everything is within the confines of rule of law. Mm -hmm. And an extra constitutional law, which is formulated and formed only for ensuring the Nagas stay united culturally, customarily, as a people. Mm -hmm. How can you participate in Indian elections? 
this would make sure that our people would be divided for life. Is this not what is happening today? Look at Dada Kojon. He is part of the Sindhi three that said that he would not contest. Right. Why is he contesting? Mm. Look at my brother Ellison. Why is he contesting? They all were part of that uh, part and parcel of that signature. I, I, I am sure they did not also expect the UNC, UNC to do something like this. Irrational move. All four are Nagas. Mm -hmm. Are you selecting a better or a lesser Naga today? Do you mean to say that Tankuls are a better and bigger Naga? Do you mean to say that even among Tankuls, the Eastern Tankul Nagas are smaller in value? Which our people have felt for generations? Which I have been fighting, telling our people, no. There is no bigger, there is no smaller Naga, there is no bigger, there is no smaller Tankul, East, West, North, South, we are all one. This I have been vociferously advocating in the Eastern area, telling them, don't have a grudge against anybody. All Tankuls are alike and same. And today the UNC's decision, this itself says that we are different. This sort of moves and this sort of decisions, this has to be stopped. For our people to stay united, our people to fight as one. The enemy is not within. I am not the enemy. Today they have considered me the enemy, which means from the first day, our fight has been all internal. Where do you expect the Naga political issue to conclude then when we are fighting amongst ourselves forever? We are Nagas. I am a Naga, which he cannot deny. Dada Kojon, Alison Ebonmai, Amai Timothy, we are all Nagas, which nobody can deny because it is not given to us by anybody, but it is an inherent right by our forefathers because of the establishment of our villages. That by right, I am a Tankul, I am a Naga, which has been reinforced, like I say again, by the laws of India. So nobody, I say again, nobody has the right to tell me you are a less Naga or a bigger Naga. But if at all a time comes when it is to be decided between a Naga and a mainland India, between a Naga and a Kuki, between a Naga and a Muslim, between a Naga and a Meite, exactly the definition of what our culture, our custom, our land, our people are, then you know exactly which side I'll be on. Nobody needs to tell me which side I should be on. It's an automatic process on which side I'll be on. But when it's all our own people and you start selecting and you start dissecting our people, that is when you know that there is something fishy and things are totally wrong. So again, I say, they still have time. UNC can still you know, issue a circular saying that since all our Nagas, all our Naga brethren, vote free and fair, do whatever you wish is best, and whoever wins, let the person work collectively for the good of our people and for the good of this state. Right. Um, you've also faced several hurdles during this campaign, a uh, blatant act of threat um, during your campaign. But then again, this isn't something new to you. Uh, you have faced or encountered these sort of hurdles in the past as well. And as far as I've heard uh, from your response from other media, uh, you've been quite diplomatic in the way you answer the way you respond to these sort of incidents that happen to you. But then again, my question is, you as a person would feel angry uh, with whatever is happening. It's almost as though they're bully bullying you. And it's like blatant violation of not just your right, but the whole electoral, democratic electoral process as well. So why do you ever feel like calling them out? Because even if you do so, it won't be wrong on your part because whatever they did, it was wrong. Here's the again. You are asking, you see, good questions, tough questions. It's nice that you should do this as youngsters. Uh, we have faced many elections, especially 2000, 2002, 2007, 2012, 2017, 22, and this is 24. This would be the seventh election where our family have faced a lot of hurdles. Mm. It is heavy and it is tiresome. It is difficult. But my father has always told us, when you know that... Uh, Again, there are two sides to this. When you know that your load is heavy, is either because you're hiding something, you have committed a crime and you're hiding something that you want, you want to stay, you know, heavy your life. The other is, when you know that you're setting out to do good and it is heavy, then you know it is right. When it is heavy, you know it is right. Because this journey I'm setting out to do, there are no hidden agendas, there are no ulterior motives. It is with a decision that I have taken from the collective. I have discussed so many times with our people, so many you know, consultations I've had with our people, with our youngsters, with our seniors, with our areas, with our leaders. Discussions as in in-depth discussions I've had. 
They have communicated me what they want, what I feel I've communicated. And then we come to an understanding saying that, yes, it is right or it is wrong. So when I know that the journey that I'm moving on is right and I'm not on a wrong path, it is heavy. But I know that the day I reach the destination, that load will be offloaded. The only difference is this load that I carry is the people's load. It is not my load. So since it's the people's load, the day I offload it, all our people will have a sense of relief. And that is when our people will also feel that, yes, this is actually what we want, you know, to call uh, progression, inclusivity, to have a heritage so rich in our culture, in our people. This is exactly what we mean to have a beautiful and wonderful future, a strong, vibrant future. All these things, everybody cannot move forward. It has to be one or the other. Today, I have voluntarily taken the decision to go ahead with this. And I am grateful that our people have believed in me. The biggest part is making people understand and believe. So they have believed. And likewise, today, you have so many people against uh, across our area who are saying that they wish to support me when they don't even know me. You, Our area, by I mean area, means the electorate across the you know, constituency outer. Mm -hmm. So I am in this election to fight for the right of our people. This includes the valley, Tobal area, Tobal Kakching. This includes the entire hills. Some may be different in desire. Others may be again lesser in want, but it's all for the interests of a collective. Now, when you are doing this, if I have ever felt that I should do it the same way, tit for tat. I'm not yet old, you see. I still have energy. The, the easiest thing to do in life is to get angry and get aggressive and go the violent way. That is the easiest. As a youngster, when I was a musician, I know, I know exactly, you know, you know getting closer to my creator, getting closer to my parents, to my community has toned me down so much. Otherwise, as a youngster, my older brother brought me, you see, from America, good guitars, original guitars. Yeah, I've broken most of them in, during my uh, younger days, mm -hmm. thinking that anger is everything. That is how you show you're powerful, that you have the power over somebody by showing your strength. No, this is something that I've realized long back. You cannot do that. People have to desire to be close to you. People have to actually want to be close to you. Commanding is one part. See, people say that, uh, especially I have a very close friend. I, you'll be knowing Ame Victor. He always tell me, you are such a tyrant. I say, Ame Victor, come on. And he says, no, you're such a tyrant. Your PROs, I have about seven, eight of them. You're too tough on them. I say, they are the only people I'm tough on. Why should I not be tough on them? They are the only people I'm tough on. But then if I'm the wrong person that they perceive me to be, they would have left me a long time back. Mm -hmm. But a single PRO has not left me till date. If you say I'm a tyrant, why have they not left me? I told him. Then he says, you have a way with words and you know, you'll win it. I said, no, nobody has left me. And they would sacrifice their lives for me. They're here with me today through thick and thin. It's because they know that I maybe shout at them sometimes, whatever it is, but they know the intentions of my heart, how clean it is. Mm -hmm. And the direction that I'm heading, I'm clear in my vision. My concept is clear. What I have to attain, how I have to attain it, and how exactly to bring about a robust, you know, inclusive, sustainably growing people. So all of this put together, it is not worth it. Violence begets violence. I have not been brought, I have not been brought up. I have not been taught. My mother is no more. I really miss her. She was always the sanity. See, my father uh, is a very godly man. He taught me how to fear God. That I agree. But it's my mother that always taught me the values of life and how to value others' lives, how to value principles of life, how to make sure that you put in the right perspectives in the right place. This has always been my mother. So I do miss her because this is the first election that I'll be facing without uh, her around. Anyway, that being said, things are so very clear that big violence begets violence. And she would always tell me, I'm, I'm sure you being Hunpun, you would know this. Hang kam chin li chin. See? It means, you know, abhorring the person that gives you advice. She always said, listen to the person. The person who gives you advice is the person. In the Bible also, so many places it's given. Mm -hmm. So 
something that is so clear here is when I'm setting out to do good for our people, for an electorate that is so vast, I think this would be one of the biggest constituencies in the country. It'd be one of the biggest, if not the biggest. So such a big area and within this constituency, I am going around telling people that I will assure you a better life, an inclusive you know, growth, a sustainable integrity which our people deserve emotionally or whichever way. When you go around advocating good things for people, how can you attain good things by me when I start showing that I am a violent person? When I start becoming a violent person, then it means that this violence I can easily transfer onto the people. Do you not think that it's because the leaders that be today, they are violent people, that this violence is percolating down to the streets? Mm. Leaders cannot be violent. You can never be violent. Yes, as a human being, I have thought many times, I have thought it over and pondered over so many times that why should I not respond in the same way? But better sense has prevailed. My father, I'm so grateful that my father is still around and he prays for me every day, every morning, afternoon, even whenever he has time, he still prays for me mm -hmm. and kept me sane. I have connected in a great way to my, to my creator. So uh, I know exactly what I say because what I say is never double-edged. It's clean. Intentions are clean. And when you say out things which are clean at heart, then God is part of that. And this, this is exactly the reason why I have never, ever advocated my people to start saying that we should start fighting this. Not toot for toot. No, we are the same people. Those people who are you know, thinking that they are doing this to me, they feel that they are doing this to an enemy, but they are not so. One day they will realize that it was a friend rather than a foe that they were doing this to. We are one family, we are one stock. They'll also realize one day is what I feel because God is there, our people are there, and it is finally the goodwill of the people that will ensure whether it's this side of the fence or that side of the fence that I'm sitting on. And I know I stand by where my people are. You've mentioned how you have tried to parlay with individuals and the people in general. Um, but despite all of your efforts to bring about transformation in our lives, good transformations, and despite your passion and your potential, why do you think there's still so much of aggression towards you from certain individuals and groups? I am only human. This world is human. Every single you know, person in this world is human. You may have 18 crore BJP followers who adore and worship Modi. 18 crore, I, I repeat again, 18 crore is their membership, that is what they say. 18 crore members of the Bharatiya Janata Party who, you know, revere and support Narendra Modi mm. as Prime Minister and as, the, as their leader. But the population of India is 140 crore. So if you have membership of 18 crore, how many 122 crore, 122 crore are not members of the BJP? So you mean to say that Modi is not a favorite leader? The whole India says, you see, when they take their vote, the media is also, you see, biased today. The media also says, nobody like Modi, nobody like Modi. But the only thing that you have to realize is the membership of BJP today is not 98 crore. It's 18 crore. 18 crore in 140 crore says there are 122 crore who are not your members. So you have to have dissent in a democracy. There has to be dissent. There has to be voices of you know, dissent. And there are different people, different types of mechanism people are using to express what it is that they want. So this is why exactly right now you have um, one group or some people in the group saying that this is what they desire. Maybe because they, have, they feel that the UNC has brought about a consensus candidate and they need to support that. But at the end of the day, it's the people who say who will be the consensus among the Nagas. Whoever wins, I think at the end of the day, would have been the consensus because it's the people that will finally decide. So, I have no desire at any point in time. All I'm doing is I'm advocating what is right. What is right, I have to keep saying, I'll never say what is wrong. Because the moment I say what is wrong, it means I'm reflecting on somebody else. I will not say what is wrong, but I will keep saying what is right. And by my saying what is right, 
if people take time to understand, to question me, and at the end of the day, finally they do understand that what I have said is right, then there is nothing like it. So I will wait my time, I'll have patience, at the end of the day, make sure that we achieve our final goal. Um, Alfred, I'd like to um, know your thoughts on your limitation, which is upcoming maybe tentative 2026. Uh, what's your take on that? The limitation also, see, it's a mandatory exercise, actually. But uh, due to God knows what reason, people filed uh, petitions in the Supreme Court and it's been frozen till 2025. So everybody is thinking that uh, the limitations will take place in 26 or 27. Uh, everybody has their own uh, thoughts on this and each person's perspective is also different again. There is no commonality here. Everybody is thinking that this would be right or that would be right. But at the end of the day, what is the basic purpose behind this delimitation exercise? What does one gain from this? One thing that we know in India is the people are supreme. Earlier you had said fundamental right. Uh, it's not a direct fundamental right. The adult franchise system is only a fundamental right for people above 18. But it is a right, freedom of expression. Now you choose your leader. How important is this to our system? Now this you have to understand very clearly. How important is our election to our system? It is everything. The entire strength and foundation of our democracy is the vote. This is why from the first day I've been saying an individual vote is sacrosanct. And this is something which the Supreme Court has very clearly said it is sacred as well as also sanctified, so sacrosanct. So a sacrosanct vote is something which is only dear to a person and that individual person itself. The very reason why EVMs were introduced was because of this, so that the vote should not be known whom the individual cast for. You can never know this. This is why they said it's sacrosanct. So it's just the total that is shown through the EVMs. This is why the Supreme Court also said that this is landmark and it's good for our people. Mm -hmm. That was the main reason why, uh, one of the basic reasons why EVMs were allowed in India. Now, protecting the identity of the voter. Let me go one step behind that now. Why does that voter need to vote? And where does that voter come from? What is the limitation? There are two things that you have to understand very clearly is voter and the limitation. Voter has nothing to do with the limitation. This part also you should understand. The limitation is exercise is conducted as per census. Voter, every six months you can shift your vote, wherever you so desire, workplace, wherever you go. It's just shifting of your, you know, your voting right. But your domicile is your permanent. So this delimitation exercise is conducted as per the actual population of those particular areas. So now, this, this fine distinction that India has made, delimitation exercise is done as per the domicile, as per the population, the original population of that area, mm -hmm. and the elector can so choose to you know, transfer anywhere the person so desires within Indian nation. So now, what is main here? What is the basic principle here? For example, let us assume that Ukhrul constituency, let us say, has uh, one lakh population as per census. But it can be that the elector can be two, two lakhs. Because you could have had, you know, many people from Imphal or from Delhi or from anywhere. You cannot be part of the delimitation exercise because you have to be a domicile of that place when the delimitation exercise is con uh, conducted because that's as per census. Mm. But your right to vote, that is transferable anywhere within the nation. So that being the case, when delimitation exercise is conducted and this is conducted as per population and when voters are you know, casting their vote, it is as per the strength of you know, that individual vote, wherever he should, he does not necessarily need to be a resident of, a permanent resident of that particular constituency. Why has this happened? This you need to know. 
So no matter what the number of the electorate, what matters is the constituency, the size of the constituency, the population of the constituency. There are many parameters and the factors that are to be taken into consideration when the limitation exercise is conducted. So how would the limitation affect the, uh, the state when an exercise does take place in the, in the, in the near future? How would it affect? For example, valley, we have 40 seats. Hills, we have 20 seats. How would, you know, you already have your constituencies. You already have the mechanism in place whereby the population requires those seats. In 1970-71, the state felt, the Delimitation Commission felt that these 40 seats are a requirement in the valley because the population so requires or desires. So, as mandated, the, these, these seats were given in the valley. So, what justice would it do the, the valley again? When you take out and say that now I want to take from here, I want to keep there, I want to keep there. It's not that the population has decreased. At least one is to one is there. The population ratio. And you don't tell me that the population has not increased in the valley. It's increased manifold today. It's not that it's decreased. You have the only place where, uh, you know, uh, anybody from India can settle is the valley, which is a mandatory law that is acceptable across monarchies. All the monarchies, the, the princely states or kingdoms that merged with the Indian Union in 90, you know, uh, after the independence of India, with context to Manipur, 49, everything that the king owned, he surrendered it to the state. So everything became the property of the state. Likewise, the whole of India became the property of the state. Whereas the hills never became the property of the state. That is the fine distinction, you see. Mm -hmm. This is why in 1971, when it became a full statehood, our system of governance, our, st our system of land, land titleship, our system of custom, our tradition, everything was protected because it was just a flow. It was just the continuation of what our lives were. Whereas in the valley and the other parts of the nation, the king was supreme. The king was supreme. So when the king is supreme and the king says, yes, I give, you know, I surrender myself to the Indian Union. I merge my, my kingdom with the Indian Union. What happens then? Everything that the king owned and governed as per his laws becomes the property of the state. But the hills never became. Because we have our own system of governance in the hills from time immemorial. This is one part. Now the other part is defining our system, our culture, our beliefs, and our advancement, and relating that with our reality of democracy today. For our people to grow, for your villages to grow, for our youngsters to grow, what you need at the core right now is the reality that we are part of this Indian Union, and we need our elected. Now, the only justice that can happen is we get our legislators as per the needs of the people, not once. Like I say, once is something that anybody can want anything. But what is the need of the people currently? How many legislators do the people need? It has to go need-based. This is something that Chief Minister Biren was very vocal about in the beginning. He would keep saying need-based, need-based, but at the end of the day, he never did need-based. This is why I lost all interest. Mm. I kept, I believed in him in a long time. In two, three years, I said, okay, if he's going to actually do it need-based, I believe that he will do something right. But it has not happened need based. He will say, I put this budget for this, for that. A white paper is there. He brought out his own white paper budget saying that this is the budget for the hills and whatever, whatever. But white paper in a state is what is presented in the legislature. The executive, they can say whatever they want, twist and turn words here. But the white paper that I had provided in 2021 was given to me by the state, by the executive, by none other than the finance minister in the floor of the house. That is what you call white paper in a democracy. There can be no other white paper. So as per that white paper, all these disparities, this has to be addressed. And for this to be addressed, how best delimitation exercise is conducted. This is why the crucial you know, moment of defining as to whether how our people are to progress in the coming days will matter a lot. So this entire delimitation exercise, it has to be based solely on a lot of, you know, uh, characters have to be put into it. The parameters that have to come into it. You have to put in all the parameters that are necessary to conduct an exercise that is actually, you know, beneficial to the people. 
that would actually do justice to the entire state. How do you do that? You cannot do that until and unless you understand the intricate details under which the state was woven. Now, what is the status of Ukul constituency when it was last, this delimitation exercise was last done in 1971? What is the status today? Has it improved or has it gone to worse, bad to worse? I would say it's gone bad to worse. Today, the BJP is saying, yesterday they were saying that we have given you, you know, free food. It is not a right. What the Congress did was given right to food. Right to food grains. Mm -hmm. You gave a food right. Now, what is the cost of food grains in the market? To be very honest, the actual cost of food grains in the market would be maybe 35 rupees, 40 rupees a kilo. Mm -hmm. Congress gave it for 3 rupees. Does it mean that Congress is buying and giving for 3 rupees? No. Actual market price, suppose Congress is buying for 30 rupees and giving for 3 rupees, it means one tenth the price. Just to make the person feel that you are also an honorable person and you are buying, it's 15 rupees, 5 kilos per person, but you're just spending 15 rupees a month. Any laborer also would, is something that you can afford, but it is something that he's buying. By buying and getting freebies, freebies means you don't even have the capability to be able to afford food grains. Is, that is not the status of India. Has India changed after National Food, National Secu National Food Security Act, NFSA? National Food Security Act was introduced by the Congress government. It was implemented. Now, the reduction in prices at that time, supposing, assuming it was 30 rupees in the open market, Congress is buying it for 30 from the, from the farmer and giving it to you and me for 3 rupees. So 27 rupees reduction is already there. Concession of 27 rupees is given, but this was never told to the public. We are reducing 27 rupees for you. But what is the publicity that BJP is doing? 3 rupees. They are removing that and saying we are giving you for free. And the people think that, oh, muft me mil rai. We are getting for free. Then the Congress, what they have done is they have removed 30 rupees from the actual price. Why should the Congress not be the one taking complete credit? It was this that was brought in as an act, a right to food act, National Food Security Act. This was legislated and passed by the Congress and implemented by the Congress. So which would the voter actually relate with? One, you have reduced 30 rupees. And this person is trying to take the credit, saying that I'm giving you free food. You are giving free food for 3 rupees. Congress reduced 30 rupees. So all of these, you see all of these things that are there in the system, which is so very clear. And this clarity has to be understood across the spectrum. Everybody has to be very clear. So for all these things that are there, the BJP will always say, you know, black, they'll say white, white, they'll say black, they'll polarize everything. How you can change through this? How one can change through delimitation? Delimitation is something that will ensure at least you know, parity of the different communities living in the state. You cannot, I cannot blame the 40 MLAs in the valley. They have their population. They have their electorate to take care of. They have to take care of them. Will, for example, will the MLA from Sagulban, he is my brother-in-law, would he say, no, 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 uh, and let me give my share to Ukrul? He cannot do that because he has his electorate. He has his community from his constituency. He has to take care of that. You talk of Dr. Ranjan, he still, he, he cannot do injustice to his people and give to my people. Mm -hmm. He cannot do that. But now what is the factor here then? Since he cannot do that, he cannot deprive one and give the other. Mm -hmm. Let it be by law. Once it becomes by law, then he neither disturbs his people or neither do I disturb my people. Everything, the flow would be as what the law says. This is why the delimitation exercise is important. It is very important because then one outdoing the other will not happen. This question of no, whether right or wrong. Let me just bulldoze this. For example, the state of Manipur has been trying to extend MLR, LR Act to the hills for a long time. Let me tell you something. Article 371C, when this was extended to Manipur, what does this say? When this was implemented, when this was inserted in the constitution, and extend it to Manipur, what, it, what does this say? It says so very clearly that, you know, any land, any forest, which is not a reserve forest, is a subject matter of the various committee. Then your custom, what is your custom? Then your property, what is your property? It's all inherited. What is hereditary becomes a subject scheduled matter of the Hillary's committee. So this is the reason why you have a law, you have a law, which has recognized your custom and your tradition. You cannot have the assembly trying to override your custom. 
It is my custom that I own my land. It is not by a right that India has given me that I own my land. India has given me a law that has protected my custom and my tradition. And that is why I respect the system. Now, you cannot have MLR LR Act that will override the custom because the, our custom is what is supreme. What was the custom in the valley? What is the tradition in the valley? It was the king. The king was the owner of everything, as you know about monarchies across the world. So when the king says, this is black, or this is white, when the king says, white is black, it also becomes black for king and country. Across the world, king is law. So when the king is law in the valley, he had absolute sweeping powers to do he or she wished in a monarchy. Whereas in our areas, it was never so. It was, this is all hereditary. The little land that I own in my village is all handed down from generation to generation to generation. Mm -hmm. If you check my, uh, what do you call, uh, my affidavit, many, most of my land is, is in the hills and the little bit that I have extra is all inherited from my father. My father has, at one point or the, or the other, he may have picked up from one of our own people or from somebody else, but it's all something that I have inherited from my father. Mm -hmm. So now, what is the question here? What is the fact here now? The fact remains that there are distinct laws. We are one people. We are one state. We, are, we have to live as one. We have lived as one. But how can you ever forget that our forefathers, which have ensured that the sanctity of this relation to remain intact, is that our entire custom and tradition has been you know, held high. This was also respected by the Maharaj of all times. Whoever Maharaj was there, this is why you and I, I'm the, we are the owners of our land. Whereas the Maharaj was the total owner of entire thing that he governed. This is clear. This is exactly the reason why delimitation, what would delimitation do? It would, you know, converge our people, our system. We are protected by our system, by our laws, by our culture. And India has reinforced that through 371C. We have to also answer to, we have to also respect that. And we have to also, you know, be obligated to that. That India also ensured that our customs and our beliefs and our tradition and our heritage was protected. So now, how do you con actually make sure that this convergence takes place and that our people grow while protecting your heritage is these exercises of delimitation. It's very, very, you know, it's a pure exercise. This should be taken as a very pure, by pure I mean clean. It should be taken as a very pure exercise to ensure that each right of a citizen as an individual, your custom, your tradition, your rights, your, your reality today, your democracy is protected. So what is the meaning of all of this? It means then this entire exercise of delimitation would make sure that the right enshrined in each constitution, in the constitutional provision of each you know, individual or area is actually implemented in letter and spirit. This is why delimitation exercise should not be taken as a tool to empower him or to you know, make me decrease or diminish my powers. It can never be done that. Earlier, I can sympathize with everybody. This has been used as a tool to empower or to make sure that people's rights are diminished because this is a way you have more, you have less. So this being the reason, you have to be very clear as to the delimitation exercise that you take up, you know. And on top of that, it's going to be a, there's going to be a delimitation commission. It's not that the MP or the MLA is going to have sweeping powers to say, I want to do this or do that. But the only difference of an MP and an MLA, and an MLA for the delimitation exercises that you represent the people. Mm. Since you represent the people, and India's constitution says, we the people, we the people of this nation. Mm. Since it says, we the people, the direct relation with the people is to be elected. And delimitation being a central list matter. Mm. So the role of a parliamentarian becomes very important to ensure that the purity of the delimitation exercise does not become political. Mm. But it remains clean and clear to exercise exactly what delimitation is supposed to do. Today, look at the delimitation exercise. I'm telling you, you take one bit from here, one bit from there, all constituencies, you know, half mm -hmm. Everybody did it at their whims and fancies at that point in time. This exercise has to be rectified. And yet, it has to remain, like I say, pure. A pure exercise that will be only and only for the people. Let the people elect whom they choose is the best. But at that point of time, the elected wanted to remain elected all the time. So they made sure that they convinced the Delimitation Commission, the governments at the, that be, and they carved out their own constituencies. That has to stop. Mm. And so this delimitation exercise, we have to fight unitedly to make sure that Manipur gets more seats, many more seats, so that 
all issues are addressed. And this, I'm certain that, uh, you know, a very conducive and inclusive uh, delimitation exercise can be conducted. So it's going to be based on needs, based on population. Um, I'm saying this because there has been an element of, say, fear, anxious element to it, when we talk about delimitation, but I can give this spell that already. Um, well, I'm offered, we don't, we can't really predict the result for this election, but there can be two outcomes, that's for sure. One is you win, and the other one, as optimistic as we want to be, uh, is that you don't. If you don't get elected this time, what would be your next course of action? Would you contest in the upcoming, I mean, the next term, for the next term? You know, there are some things that uh, women always say. Supposing I, I ask you now, what is your age? You'll say, don't ask women their age. Politicians never ask them, what is your next step? If you ask them that, and they tell you that, then the element of surprise is gone. So let me see. Uh, it's with great difficulty that I took this call. Our, our, our educated class, our youngsters, our leaders, I have consulted, I think, almost everybody. I can't go to every single person, but to a collective. We have had meetings and meetings, several rounds of discussions. Uh, eight months I've held discussions, and I felt that they did desire that I should contest. This is not something that I've imposed on people. Mm. I know. I have met most of our, our, our community elders and our community youngsters, our community leaders, our community you know, scholars. At various levels, discussions have taken place. And I have placed before them exactly what I want to do with our reality and what exactly is our desire. We cannot live in a des desire which is not yet our reality. So this is why my reality, I want to actually make sure that it's reinforced and to make sure that what our forefathers have left us, we stay, you know, dedicated to it. Like, you know, the spirit has to be clean, intent has to be clean, and make sure that don't traverse, you see, into other people's rights. You try and do this. No, that should never happen. India also does not allow that. You are defined within the boundaries of your house. What are the boundaries of my house? Like I said, I am Tankul, no doubt. But my rights over my custom, my culture, my heritage is my village. Beyond my village, I have nothing. Because if I, even if I wish to purchase a piece of land in Koso, I cannot buy. The law says no. So if I want to go and buy a village from Shangjing, that's next door. It says no, I cannot. It's only within their village they can do. This is why whether I, what I go and do after these present elections, these results, I, I cannot you know, predetermine now. But I am set on one part. Our family is also, see, in a way, uh, time take, takes its toll. Time takes its toll. And, and like I say, how many times can, how many parts of our life can we keep saying yes to? That, okay, okay, we'll hold on. My father is 98 today. He's a very, very old man. And I, I so wish that the son, you know, has come up and has done something that, uh, my father has been deprived of all his years. So many times we have gone through what I'm going through today. A single day, my father never said no. Reply back, never. You know, one day they'll realize that it's all for the good of our own people. So this is why today I'm, I'm very clear on this. I sincerely wish that God is on my side. If God is on my side, I'm, I'm sure God cannot be partial. All four of us are Christians and we have one God. But I sincerely wish that God is on my, wife, on, on my side and then that I can actually execute what it is that the people have wanted our family to do. My father could not. Maybe he's still alive, still strong, still sharp. He, he will get to see through his son that at least something right has happened by us coming to Manipur. It's been 40 years we've come to Manipur. Mm. I so you know, desire so much that my mother come back, but she won't. At least my father is still around. I don't know how many more years, but he's, he's, he's around. He's 90, hitting 98. And I have this recently I told my party leaders also, if, if not to the whole world also, if just to my father also, that I owe it to my father that, see, you have raised up a good son and I am doing at least right to our people and right to, our, to, 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 the, to, the, to the land, to the law of the land. I'm, I'm going right by, by all these parameters. So he'll get to see it. And then I so wish that something of that sort happens. So God willing, uh, that will happen this time. But you're confident. How confident are you? This time? I am confident that my God is there. I'm very confident my God is there. And uh, all these people that have come to me this time, coming and meeting me, coming and speaking to me, they, are, they, are, they, are, they, they don't know me. 
they don't know me. They really don't know me. And they're still coming forward and telling me that we will, you know, come and stand up for you and we'll vote for you. Across the spectrum, people are coming about. Be it Thobal, be it Kakching, be it Ukrul, Senapati, Tamenglong, Chandel, you know, uh, Churachanpur. Any area, every area has now become my area. There is one part that I would like to make very clear to you. It's, uh, it's very hilarious also. People say, we don't need an orator, we need a performer. You see, you talk of any, any leader in this world, most leaders, the skill to communicate with people. If you don't have knowledge inside, what will you communicate to people? What you communicate to people, sometimes it's just politics. But in politics, what you have to understand is that technically and legally, you have to be right first. If you are technically and legally right, then you can make sure that you can take your people forward. With just politics, you cannot, because if you cannot legislate laws, if you cannot bring about rules legally and technically, which would be sound, where are you going to take your people? You have to be technically and legally right. I think I'm technically and legally very right. And I think technically and legally being right means you have to study a lot also. You have to read a lot also. It's just not airdrop. Or suddenly I wake up in the morning, oh, in my dream, I, I know this, I have all this knowledge. It doesn't happen that way. This expression of how I express what I have inside. If people say that it is just mere good oratory skills, I wish, you know, knowledge also can just flow with everybody. It doesn't happen that way. A lot of hard work is put into it. A lot of dedication. I have, as of today, I don't have a single friend. It's not because I, people don't want to befriend me. I have opted not to have friends. I just stay my own way. Either I have work and I go out, or I stay home, stay with my family, and permanently home. Permanently home. Stay within the confines, four, 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 confi four walls of my home. I am there. It's not because I also do not want to go out and then meet friends and do this or do that. It's not that. But your time is precious. You have one life. You have one job. And that one job, whether I can actually succeed in delivering or not. If I cannot succeed, it means I have failed. I agree. But what about those hundreds and thousands? For example, this Lok Sabha. It's hundreds of thousands. It's in lakhs, the numbers that will vote. So hundreds of thousands of people that have believed you. Are you going to make sure that they are taken to a deep ravine and throw them down there? You cannot. So like I'm saying, you have to be technically and legally very sound. And this fine line of politicking within that, you have to make sure that you express exactly what you intend to do. So one speaks better, one does not speak better. So you cannot, nobody can question the fact that, see, it is, if it is just loose talk, uh, we're just making gups up, this, that, whatever, with no content, anything. Anybody can do that. But when it is content-based, mind you, all the discussions I've had with our leaders, our community people, our educated youth, our scholars, has all been content-based. All content-based. Everyone has grilled me inside out, content-based. And I have, I think, to a great extent, 99.99%, .99%, I think I've satisfied them. That I'm prepared. So this preparation is not verbal, you see. It's all content-based. So when people see and they believe that, yes, this man is ready, it's not because you speak. You have to know how to speak. No matter how intelligent or no matter how wise you are, if you cannot put your actions into words. In parliament, are you going to use sign language? Or are you going to you push across a piece of paper and tell the speaker, you please read it because I don't, I don't know how to read it properly? It is an added advantage, no doubt. Mm. It is an added advantage to have skills to communicate with people. Being a good orator, it is very much a big added advantage. But that is not the entire purpose and the content of what one speaks. Mm. So this is why youngsters or elders alike, they should never be taken away by all these flimsy one-liners. Mm -hmm. you know, some people have good oratory skills, but you need a performer. What is it that one wishes to perform? Like I told you, go to Petit Crew. That is my performance. Go to eight months. You, you, you saw my daughters today. They are five today. In 2020, uh, March, when I was assigned uh, COVID in Ukrul, oh, March 26th, I went in on 27th, and I came back to Imphal only in November. I did not even spend one night in my house. 
with my family. My, I committed my time to our people. Thousands and thousands of returnees, thousands and thousands, mind you. Me, myself, with the district administration, you know, cleaning the homes, cleaning hostels, making sure that our, our people who are coming back, something is ready for them. Sleepless nights, my entire team, the commitment, the level of commitment that I gave, I can guarantee that this, this level that I gave, there would have been no other legislator, be it in the hills or valley, the, the level that I gave. Eight months, I stayed permanently in Okru, center to center, and I was never photographed. I never allowed people to photograph and video this. I didn't allow that. The, those people who came into those centers and the people who worked with me, the district administration, they know. They know my, what my content is. You would have seen Shiri Festival, Shirok, you would have seen. My commitment to bring about tourism, to bring about, you know, inclusive tourism, which would be 365 days a year. What I did not know, I moved heaven and earth to make sure that the festival from first to second to third, the trajectory every year, how it grew, everybody is a witness to it. This is not because I have nothing better to do. It's to, because our people are starved of income. Some people at that, during Shirok 2019, I know, some families earned up to three lakh rupees in six days. But most families, they earned at least a minimum. The least that a family earned was about 10, 12,000 in six days. So all I was telling our people was, if we can earn six, seven, six, seven days of our time through tourism, if we can earn 10,000, suppose we do this our whole year through, what would it be? Sleepless nights, I would visit villages, be it the smallest Moyopung or be it, you know, uh, Rambu, Tiem Som, all of these villages tell them that, you know, we have to be the perfect host. God has given us an, an inherent trait in us, that is hospitality. We know how to feed people. We know how to be good to people. Our people are blessed with this. So when people come in and out day or night, welcome them, you give them this. So even to that extent, to the extent of providing pineapples, water, buying all of that and stationing at these centers, to that extent, how much we worked so that at least the world understood our people. Today, what is happening is our people are placed across the world, especially across India. Mm. We are in the hospitality sector. Most of our people, why is it so that they choose our people? It's because they see us as very hospitable, mm -hmm. very friendly. So why should the world not come to us then? This is why I keep saying we can conquer the world because we have been blessed with this. So I took that opportunity and made Shirok into you know, something that is bigger than anything in three years. I cannot say anything about what is happening now. I wish it best and hopefully things will get better. But the level of commitment, the commitment of how to improve a road from, from Shiri to Kachopung. Look at that road today. Look at what it was when I won. Ask those people there. They would carry their people two days. I did not need to do anything. I kept going on that road. I drove myself personally. How many times I went, how many times? It would not be five, ten times more than that which people will not do, go even once in a lifetime. How many times I went there and what happened? What is the result of that? Every brought in, everybody brought in their machinery, the department, the contractors, and look at the size of the road today. Do you think it has happened automat automatically? They had already exhausted most of the funds that time when I had one. I didn't say I called meetings after meetings and I started traveling. They started putting machinery after machinery into that area. And then today it's such a big you know, road that the entire community, the, this is exactly what we are here for. We don't need to tell people, I'm doing this for you, I'm doing that for you. I know what I have done. Exactly what I have done, I know. And for this, I'm happy. I committed my time, I committed my life for my people. You ask any of my PROs, you ask any of my drivers, and they will tell you. In five years, I went to Ukru 852 times. Would you be able, in your lifetime, I think you have not done that. In five years, Ask my people. In a day, I would go up, come back, because I had work, come back and go back the same day. See? So you really kept tab. Yes. I, our people see, every, every time we have to fill gas. Gas is something that you have to fill. There is a register for gas. So you know exactly that you are filling gas and you're moving. So 800 times you, you travel to Ukul, it's like, in one lifetime, you and me, elderly citizen in Ukul, go and ask them, you know, 800 times have you traveled to Ukru? People laugh it off. My workers, that's what my, 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 my main 
Pian Rose, everybody, they say, us, I mean, we don't know what all this is for, but we trust you. Just the fact that I kept going again and again and again and again, for, for every small reason, every big reason, whatever it is, I, the only thing I was trying to tell them was, I cannot be here permanently. But as long as I'm here, then they would also, you know, it would be streamlined because they would say, ah, Emily is around. Most of the time he's here. So everything is streamlined and it becomes part of their life. Mm. When I kept going to Petigru every, you know, weekend or once in a fortnight or minimum once a month, when I start, started going, I kept going to Petigru. What happened? Teachers were in attendance. Students started coming. Mm -hmm. I requested them that this, this, these are the parameters I want for you to take up. Mm -hmm. They also diligently did that. Today you have Petigru College with 1,200 students. Do you think this has just happened? It's a commitment that I have given to my people and I've lived to that commitment. I know I have. I have diligently done what I have to do. A limitation as a human being where I could not reach, that's another part. Mm -hmm. But within the confines and limits of my capacity, I have done what I had to do. And at the end of the day, lastly, I don't know to what extent our people would, uh, would recognize or would say yes or no to. A lot of people would ask what I did with the little bit of powers that I had. Mm. They can go around village to village. Some villages may not have got. I'm not saying everybody, but majority means majority. During my five years tenure, 2,000 housing schemes I gave. 2,000. 2,000. You know, people who can to, to make their homes, 2,000. Four bundles each to each person, 2,000. And I think since the inception of housing schemes in Ukrul, what I gave in five years is more than the beginning till now. So this is not a joke. All these things we don't tell people just because we don't tell. I know what I have done. And I know the people that I have got. Ukrul, for example, Ukrul alone got, I think, more than 750. Ukrul headquarter alone got more than 750. This is not from the government, it's all from my MLA funds, which is permissible. Mm -hmm. And these are all good. This is not that, you know, that, you know those, those very, very thin ones which will break. It's all Tata, original Tatas. All of these things that were given to the masses. Just one question here, Amir, Amir Ofer. Uh, yes. Did you ensure that the help, the aid reached the beneficiaries? Yes, 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 why not? It did. I, I know personally because these are all decimated to the units. Some, I remind you, some. There are two, three villages which came and took it and they sold it. That I know. And not Ukhul headquarter, but some villages. Some villages, two, three villages, they sold it off because one beneficiary, I think it was coming to about 25,000 per beneficiary. Uh, the, the, the GI sheet. It was very good quality Tata. So this is why some, they sold off. Two, three villages, not more than that. But majority, they got it. So all these achievements, people would, you know, uh, throw it under, under the carpet. People would not want to, do, to say all these things, but this is reality. Let it go side by side. If they feel that I'm found wanting, mm. that I have not just done justice here or there, mm. at least say the things that I did right. right. Pedigru, I did right. Mm. District Hospital, I did right. Mm. Then what do you call Corona, I did right. Mm. The entire Kachopung Road, I did right. Mapum High School, I did the best. I did what was necessary, and I made sure that one of the best schools for imparting quality education was established there. Today, it is in total ruins. There is nothing there today. Mm. So so many things that I actually succeeded in doing. These things people will not even talk about because they know that it is reality. And this reality, are, most of our youngsters, I feel that they also know. Mm. It's just that I'm not propagating. Like you were asking me earlier, I'm Alfred, I don't think you're using social media or you're, you're using the media well enough. I said, I have never used media. The only thing I've always felt was the people that I've touched, they should have spoken out. Okay. But the problem with our people, they think that, no, our elected, it is his duty. It is not so. It is not that it is my duty to come around and do all of this. I have diligently and competently done what I had to do. It is his duty also, if he is satisfied, to express openly saying that this is a leader who I believe in. Mm -hmm. If not openly, they should say, no, we don't believe these leaders. So the only things that I've seen till date is people criticizing. And I agree with it. It is a free world. Mm -hmm. You have to learn to criticize. Without criticism, there can be no change. There cannot, there, there cannot be betterment. But at the same time, I'm also human the right things that I have done in life, the good things that I have done for our people. I think this, the people also need to know and taking all these factors into consideration, not being lured by anything, but the commitment to serve for our people and that also not blindly, mm. conceptualizing, putting the contents right, legally and technically correct and politically fighting a war which I know is right. I have put all the dots together. There is no dot untouched. So this is why I say, a destination is something that one creates. 
But the path is what is most difficult. Mm. We're traveling that path and that destination that has been, you know, uh, a desire of so many people, I'm, I'm very certain that we'll reach there. I'd like to mention this to the audience because it's election season and they'll be questioning, and rightly so, as to why we reached out only to the INC candidate. But the, the fact is, we did reach out to the other candidates as well, especially the uh, NPF candidate. They were, in a way, willing to talk to us, but I suppose because of clash and schedule, because they're all very busy these days, we haven't really been able to come up with a uh, a, a visible time for this kind of conversation. Um, well, we've had this conversation. I hope people you know, will be able to get something out of it. But now I would like you to maybe just directly address the audience in just maybe two or three sentences, your last say. What our people know is right or wrong. I can't teach them that. I can't tell them that what I'm saying is more right. It's his life or her life. All I'm saying is the decision that you take will define whether your life needs to be the right life or anybody will direct that path. Your power is restrained and contained within yourself only. How much you talk about, you can talk till the cows come home about what Modi is doing right or wrong, or what Biren is doing right or wrong. But no matter what you speak or shout, you can change nothing there. You can really change nothing there. But if you are indeed speaking out against all these people and saying that it is right or it is wrong, that right or that wrong, to put it in the right perspective, is before you today. The only right that India has given you, the only right that you being born in our area today, as a citizen of this place, the only right that you truly have, like I said earlier, my right in my custom, my heritage is my village. Today, the only right that all of the electors have from outer Manipur parliamentary constituency today is the right that is before you. It is only before you. The right that other people have, you have no right over that. And you don't even have a right to point your finger at that person. Because you cannot change what that person will do. He'll do or she will do what they have to do. You have no authority or no right to direct that person. So you have that right. That inherent right is with you today. You being born and you reaching the age of 18. Exercising your adult franchise. This is an inherent right that you, you know, automatically inherit once you hit 18. Mm. This is a right that you have inherited. Mm. Nobody has the right to take this away. You have inherited this right, not by anybody, but by being born here, by being an elector here, the day you hit 18, it is not the UNC, neither is it my village, neither is it Tangkolong, neither, neither is it Kokomi, neither is it UCM or anybody. Nobody has inherited this right, but you yourself as an elector, the day you hit 18, you inherited this right. It is your right by inheritance to cast this vote. So, all I will say is, everybody across the world, I have Tamo Bimol from the inner, who has been you know, advocating so very clearly that a couple from the US also have come and campaigning for him. I would so sincerely ask and appeal to all other electorate, come home, come home, show the world that you know this is an inherent right which I'm not willing to absolve or to let go. If you have not realized till today, it's time you did, and you make sure that this voice is heard. The moment you actually execute your inherent right with all clarity of thought and sincerity in your heart to bring about inclusivity and good growth, sustainable growth, I'm telling you, the magic will work by itself. I'm here. I'm committed. My life is committed. Nobody, I, I repeat again, anybody, be it the ruling dispensation or the opposition, if they have a single dot on me saying that, no, 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 he sold out his people there. He went and did something wrong there. I challenge those people. Let them come. Come and tell me. Speak to me openly. I challenge everybody. Come and let's speak. I have committed to our people. And it's because of this committed commitment that I have read, I have discussed, I have deliberated, 
I have done everything necessary as per what the law mandates and what our people require. This is why I am here today contesting, not because of the want that I want, but it is a need of our people that I wish to execute and make sure I deliver. So everybody, come home, cast your vote, and I know I would, I would want that, you know, first time, there is always a first time. This is a very crucial election. Come home, cast your vote, and if you feel that it is right to cast for me, I would most certainly want that you cast your vote for me. Thank you. Well, there you have heard it from the man himself. I don't have much to add, but maybe just a little reminder, a crucial one, that your vote is going to decide your future. Um, so cast them well. Well, that's the end of our segment. Thank you so much for watching.